dear doctors we are live i welcome you all on behalf of doa for this midcon meeting for the convenience of all this meeting has been divided into four parts the first part will be by national president and national secretary of ioa it will be compared by dr lalit mani second and third part are basically on the wrist injuries two different sessions one will be moderated by dr harmesh kapoor other will be moderated by dr vinay dabas last session is presentation of uh, prizes for quiz and for poster presentation and vote of thanks by dr atul vaish so now i invite dr lalit mani to introduce the two speakers dr b shiv shankar and dr navin takkar and proceed from the, on the platform Dr. Lalit, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Dr. Lalit, you start now. I'll share again. Sorry for that hiccup. Yeah, Dr. Lalit. Yeah. So thank you all and uh, welcome uh, to the Delhi Orthopedic Association Mid-Year Conference. the theme every year is on trauma and this year we have uh, chosen uh, wrist injuries as the theme so it's an honor and pleasure uh, to have both the president and secretary of indian orthopedic association here with us today on uh, this important event of delhi orthopedic association and uh, thank you dr shiv shankar and dr navin thakkar on taking out time agreeing to be a part of uh, this important event it's a big encouragement to the state uh, uh, chapters when the president and uh, secretary both become a part of the conferences and it gives encouragement to all of us uh, to improve every year so let me give a very brief uh, introduction to dr shiv shankar he is a person who is very well known to all of us to all of you and uh, i will still make a few words about uh, him he has been a great leader he has been a great innovator and he has been a great uh, clinician he started his journey by graduation from hubli and post graduation from solapur after additional training in mumbai birmingham uk and stuttgart germany he is practicing in solapur at ayer orthopedic center since 1993 interestingly it is a iso 9001 and 208 certified hospital He became a secretary of IMA Solapur branch in 1996. He is a very active uh, Rotary Club member, and he was president of Rotary Club of Solapur in 2002. He has been the chairman of Computer Society of India, the Solapur chapter, in uh, 2010. He is one of the known persons about nails in this country. So, if you talk about nails, you talk about Professor Doctor. Shiv Shankar. He was one of the trio who formed the National Association of Interlock uh, Surgeons in two zero eight. He was the president. Before that, he was one of the main person behind forming this association, and it has been doing uh, wonders uh, since then. He has been uh, on various positions in Maharashtra Orthopedic Association. Especially, he has helped the association. in various uh, medical legal activities uh, various administrative reforms and various other in maharashtra orthopedics and then he became the president of maharashtra orthopedics in 2015 we are very happy uh, that he is now the president of indian orthopedic association and he is uh, showing us light to all the state chapters today he is going to talk about uh, uh, one of his many innovations and we are excited to hear about it you might not be knowing that he has many many innovations uh, to his name but being a humble person he names all of them to solapur so let allow me to enumerate his innovations which are solapur technique of interlock nailing for fractures of femur and tibia solapur type of external fixator for distal radius fracture which we'll listen today solapur sleeve for keyhole surgeries for femur 
solapur sleeve for keyhole dhs and modified instrument for keyhole dhs solapur broken nail extractor solapur adapter for k nail extraction solapur condylar screw for femur and tibia solapur technique for uh, removal of stuck drain tube and many more he has done monumental numbers of workshops maybe over 500 and amazing number of uh, camps free surgeries all around in various states and also in various countries through his uh, rotary association he has worked a lot in african countries like uganda tanzania nigeria and ethiopia there's a long list uh, but i'm i'm sure uh, we want to listen to his uh, talk and i welcome once again Dr. Shiv Shankar, for uh, honoring uh, us with his presence. Thank you very much. Next is uh, uh, Dr. Navin Thakkar, who is the second uh, dignitary from Indian Orthopedic Association in this session, and uh, he's a very very close friend of mine. And we both have actually traveled the journey of orthopedics together. We we've been the same age and uh, uh, we uh, love the friendship of each other so a uh, very warm welcome to you dr navin thakkar he is very well known for his it skills again a, a, a very grand innovator so if you look at his uh, short descript over here which i could accommodate in one slide he almost has all the medals and awards which are given in indian orthopedic association he has the nails con uh, gold medal the sushrut award which is again for implants and innovations the sp mandal gold medal of ioa which is for uh, rational orthopedics the kt dolakia gold medal which is one of the best papers in that conference and it's so heartening to know that he uh, he is the first indian resident orthopedic surgeon getting two usa patents for innovation so he was, he's even gone ahead on uh, documenting his innovations in the form of patents he has been decorated by uh, iim ahmedabad by gold medal for innovations he has been the secretary of uh, gujarat orthopedic association from 2015 to 18 and currently he also holds the chair of gujarat orthopedic association president it's an honor and pleasure to have dr navin thakkar at uh, this session and uh, it's a great pleasure to have two leading innovators in this country on this opening session of uh, mid year conference of delhi orthopedic association so with this small brief i would uh, invite uh, dr navin uh, dr uh, shiv shankar to start uh, with his deliberation uh, on what he is going to talk about uh, the lower end radius thank you sir thank you very much navin friends whatever you saw on the slide that was the only bio data i had given to lalit but he has made it elaborative way getting my whole diet bio data from various sources thank you very much today i'll be talking about the solar proof frame a new economical external fixator with a quadrilateral fixation uh you can see that uh, this fixator requires only 40% of the inventory compared to any multiplanar or quadriplanar fixator i am going to talk about this and how we are going to use this friends for comminuted fractures or comminuted intraarticular fractures ligamento taxis is the treatment of choice we do get beautiful reduction on table under anesthesia but the problem will be the fracture collapses within the plaster in due course of time so maintaining this in distracted position is one which is problematic young lady of 41 years treated conservatively you can see a unhappy outcome and i had to treat this patient for that deformity so grip will be weak prominence of the ulna there will be deformity of the wrist so all the things are very very painful for the patient another say 68 year person unstable distal radial fractures treated with k wire you can see on the right side how it resulted in spite of the surgery being done so i the patient was not uh, happy with the earlier treatment 
when I suggested to him distraction of the radius and to get the length back. So he said he doesn't have the time. So I had to do the alna shortening, though the radius is still tilted upwards, but he said it's okay. So this is what many of the patients end up and we should not say that distal radial fracture patients do well. I do treat stable fractures with percutaneous caver fixation plaster. I do plate them with the availability of the plates, especially the recent low profile locking plates which are available. You can, and also the direction of the screws can be changed. They have helped a lot and ma majority of the patients, I still do operate if they are high demanding people, but for low demanding people, a economical fixation I use. If a fracture like this comes to us, the first thing what we see is it can be distracted with ligament taxes. But unfortunately, the uniplanar fixators, which are commonly available in the market, they have only two shan spin in the second metacarpal and two shan spin in the radius. The problem with that is you cannot control the translation. Pinge is required to give ulnar deviation. Additional fixation of the fractures like caver fixation is required to get good um, outcome with this because this is a uniplanar fixator. So uniplanar fixators cannot control the translation. As you can see on the first x-ray here, the translation could not be controlled by a one plane fixator. Also to give alna deviation, a hinge is required. And this is a specific pinched fixator only for radial fractures. It should be available. Third is to get better results, we try to fix the fractures. Instead of using plaster, we use this hinge fixator. So basically, this fixator is doing just the job of a plaster. We also have a just fixator, which is very cumbersome to apply. You can see I had to apply 10 Ys and 22 clamps to get this reduction in an unstable fracture. The patient had a wound. That is the reason why I used it. It takes almost one to one and a half hours to apply this fixator. For Elizro people, yes, Elizro is a treatment of choice, the ring fixator, but the hand cannot be used because there is a round ring which comes all around. So with the fixator, patient will never be able to do any of the work. So that is the reason why I'm promoting this Solapur frame with just 40% of the inventory giving a multiplanar fixation. Translation can be avoided unlike a uniplanar fixator. There is no hinge required. With this X type of uh, fixation, you can give ulnar deviation, palmar tilt, everything you can do in this. What I was doing before this, I used to fix radial side with two shan spin and two shan spin in the radius and two shan spin in the second metacarpal and connect that with a rod. Again, alna side, I used to fix another four shan spin and fix with a rod. Then combine both of them with two more rods with two, four more clamps to get a quadriplanar fixation. So we had to use eight shan spin. 12 S clap clamps and four connecting rods minimum. This is how I was myself treating earlier a comminuted distal radial fracture with a multiplanar fixation because uniplanar fixation doesn't give all the support what we require. So while I was operating one of the case as a lecturer in medical college, after applying the radial side and the pins on the ulnar side, we came to know that the clamps which are available were not fitting properly because different sizes clamps are available. So the clamps were not checked earlier preoperatively. So the clamps were not fitting properly and 12 clamps were not available to fix all of them. So what we did was we fixed one radial metacarpal to the ulnar side uh, shan spin in the ulna. And again, the second ulnar metacarpal in the fourth and fifth metacarpal to a radial side shan spin, like a X. And the person who was assisting me, Dr. Barave, who is now working in Pune, he said, sir, one more clamp is still working. And he said, we can apply here. So we applied the fifth clamp at this area. And 
this patient with so much of combination did so excellently well that we started using this in medical college because it was instead of eight shans pin only shans four shans pin was required instead of four connecting rods only two connecting rods was required instead of 12 clamps only five clamps were required so it was very very economical and it saved lot of time also so how we do it we pass the first metacarpal in the basis of second and third metacarpal and second metacarpal at an angle of 120 degree between the first one uh, in the same second metacarpal we apply similarly in the middle mid radius we apply two radius and shan spin again they make an angle of 120 degree more than 90 degree if it is less than 90 degree with one another they become uniplanar fixator if we go back to the basics of fixer external fixator so it has to be more than 90 degree to one another then only it becomes multiplanar fixator then after applying four shan spin we connect in the fashion in this fashion so there is escolab clamps it can accommodate 3 mm to 4 mm radius ulna pins are available which can be connected on one 4 mm connecting rod and the 3.5 mm shan spin can be fixed this hole you can see is not round 4 mm round it is vertically the depth is less it's only about 3 mm so if you put a 3.5 mm shan spin it can get sandwiched between this and it can hold it beautifully well similarly for the metacarpals we have a smaller hole so that holds the 2.5 metacarpal shan spin these are the two types of escolab clamps which are available in the market so how we pass the first metacarpal so first we pass the uh, feel the base of the take a small nick and i normally use a 8.1.8 km k wire as a bit since i am using a k wire the soft tissue will not get entangled so i don't use any of the sleeves or anything i just pass directly the second metacarpal shan spin which is passed through the base of second and third metacarpal that's very very important then next we pass the uh, flex the index finger so that the uh, movement will happen properly once the finger is flexed then take a small nick over the middle of the second metacarpal and again x go up to the bone with the hypostat mosquito forceps make it 1.8 mm i am showing it should not be 190 degree angle it has 120 degree and so So 120 degree, I'm drilling, and I'll pass the second somewhere about a centimeter from away from the base of the uh, second metacarpal will be in the shaft. So this is the second shan spin I'm putting, and confirm that under CM that adequately it is passed. Now the assistant holds the radius, and makes the radius. And a small nick is taken again, again with the You must add artery forceps up to the bone. It is reached. Now I use a 2.5 millimeter K wire and drill. So people will be thinking without uh, putting water or putting without putting sleeve. Why I am drilling? So because I am using a K wire, it is smooth. Soft tissue doesn't get entangled. So I do put some time water, but in this video I have taken without putting the water while drilling. So shan spin is applied. And this shan spin is parallel to the second metacarpal. I have put similarly parallel to this one more shan spin is passed about an inch after the first metacarpal. Uh, the third shan spin I have passed. So again, you can see that this makes an angle of about 120 degree with the shan spin here, and the shan spin is passed. Once. this four shan spin is passed it hardly takes about 5 minutes to pass the shan spin confirm that the shan spin is properly positioned and the opposite side it is yes then i tighten the connecting rod only on the radial sides two shan spin these two shan spins are tightened with the connecting rod 
this clamp and metacarpals are loose. Now, assistant, two assistant gives traction and counter traction. If I want to manipulate the fracture, I can manipulate it at time. Majority of the reason time manipulation is not required. I just try to the clamp in distracted position. So, so getting reduction in a perspective is not at all a problem. Then this is the fifth clamp. After connect clamping both these two clamps, the fifth one is tightened. So this external fixator does the work of maintaining the fracture reduction and also it will does the work of plastering. And the advantage of this fixator is while you are clamping the metacarpal clamp pins, you can give palmar tilt as well as the alda division without the hinge because there is only one metacarpal uh, pin on either side. So since there are only one chance pin on either side, you can give the whatever the tilt and flexion you want at the wrist. In that position, you can fix the metacarpal chance pins and extra length chance pin are cut off and not to, to prevent injury to the limb. Uh, sticking plaster or sticking paper is applied over that. So this is a patient where I put it. And the patient will be able to use the hand since the fixator is only on one side and farmer said there is nothing, the patient will be able to use the hand. Here are some pictures. An intra-articular fracture, you can see such a beautiful reduction. This is in 2003, I have done this patient and this is April 2003, just before the fixator was removed. This is in May 2003, after the implants have been removed beautiful alignment we have obtained in this uh, intra-articular fracture. Another patient, a father of two doctors, one cardiologist in Nagpur and a, another daughter is also a uh, doctor. So they were not happy with this reduction because they sent the pictures to some of their friends. They said that this reduction is not good. So the father was concerned and the children were also concerned. I just applied a fixator and you can see beautiful anatomical restoration could be obtained in this uh, person. And this is after four years, the beautiful function of the wrist in the same patient. This is hardly you can see the markings of the incisions for the putting the shans pin, what we have applied the pick up. Uh, this is at the end of four years, you can see the nice restoration of the radial length, radial angle, and the radial tilt, everything has been uh, restored. Friends, uh, don't think the radial, uh, distal radial fracture can be uh, accept some malunion. So if anatomy is restored, the grip strength will improve, then there will not be pain at the distal radial ulnar joint. So it's, we should try to get the anatomy restored. Another patient, bilateral fracture, Bilateral wrist fractures, again, I have used on both the side fixator and both the side, he did extremely well. Another patient, there was an ulna fracture also. Uh, for ulna fracture, I just incorporated a wire into the ulna and, and incorporated the same through just fixator into our fixator. Another patient had a radial radio ulna joint subluxation where with the fixator, I have passed a K wire through the distal radial joint and I have incorporated to the fixator and this is the x-ray at three years and the function at three years in the same patient. This lady was my neighbor. She lives in the same building of mine. Uh, she had a crush fracture of the distal radius with intraarticular fracture and also other style process fracture which I have treated with a external fixator and this is after two months the beautiful Anatomical restoration, you can see. You see the clinical function she is able to do. She was able to do all the activity at her home with this fixator on. So she was even able to take bath and also do rotis and use the balan. That was the beauty of this fixator. So this is after almost five years with the patient. I called her to take the clinical pictures. And this is the, for comparison, I have taken both the sides x-ray. You can see nice anatomical restoration on both the sides. And this is on the left side I have operated. And the right side is a normal wrist, which looks the same as the opposite side. Another intra-articular fracture and styloid process fracture, just with a distraction, it came in position with the fixator. And 
the end result was good. Another case, see how the fracture is. There is a sliver in the volar fragment and there is ulna stylard process fracture. Ulna stylard process fracture, I fix with a K wire and incorporate it in the fixator. And you can see the nice, beautiful restoration of the anatomy at the end of the treatment in this patient. So this is the beauty of this fixator. Another patient, badly comminuted fracture in the extra articular, though there is no intra articular part, extra articular, there is a lot of combination and osteoporosis you can see, and this is uh, the end result. So many cases, these are different cases, I have taken the picture, these are different x-rays I have shown here, different cases where I have used, I might have used in more than 500 cases, and so many people in Sholapur also use. Another fracture, actually intra articular fracture with extra articular combination, you can see this is some recently treated few months back. Uh, another young engineer treated with this fixator showing his good function and very happy end result. This patient, you can see there is a diapunch fracture. I didn't do anything. Just I applied the fixator. I didn't do any intrafocal uh, manipulation. The fragment came back in position just with the ligamentotaxis. So this is the beauty of this fixator. This patient came almost three weeks after the initial injury. You can see there is so much of radial shortening in this patient. I applied the fixator and I was unable to get the reduction properly in the distal radial joint. What I did was I took out the fixator and I had simple distractors on either side. That is the reason why I said that the second metacarpal, both this metacarpal and the radius ulna should be parallel to one another. So if they are parallel to one another, you can we put a simple distractor and distract and get the radial length back. So these two wires are parallel to one another. These two wires are parallel to one another. So nowadays, I don't even have to remove the fixator to apply a distractor. What I do is I apply the fixator, keep the clamps loose. I apply a simple distractor and distract it over this. Another patient, you can see distal radial fracture in a 15 days old with radial shortening treated with a fixator and again followed by solar pool frame to maintain. So this is the, uh, recently this patient came, this patient came almost after five weeks after the injury, though he had shown to orthopedic surgeon on 7th of February, he did not take treatment. He came to me on 7th of March. So what I did was I applied a solar pool frame as well as I applied a simple distractor and on table, now you can see that to and it is not possible to get the full distraction on table sometimes. So what I do is the patient with the post of I do do the distraction till I get back to distraction. This patient got back the length just in this time. So I just compare the radial stylite process and just come back. Once it comes back in position, I have taken the x-ray. You can see that it has come back to position So with the distractor. Now I just take out the distractor. So I just clamp the shans, uh, square clamps and maintain the solar pool frame and I take out the fixator. You can see the fixator has been taken out after the distraction is over. And this patient, normally I, I keep this frame distracted for four weeks time. And on the OPD basis, I release the traction at the end of four weeks and he will be maintained for another two to three weeks with the fixator. But this patient came late because of lockdown. And normally, if you keep this wrist distracted for more than six to eight weeks, they have a sort of uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy. That is the reason why I normally keep the distraction only for about four weeks time. Once gummy callus forms, then I'll release the traction. This is the end result in the same patient. He had some uh, problem like a sympathetic ref uh, reflex, some sympathetic dystrophy. This patient had a badly sutured volar wound, so I used the external fixator. I don't think anything else will be possible in this patient. Another patient, badly comminuted intraarticular fracture, treated with the external fixator, and you can see nice, beautiful restoration at the time of fixation removal. This elderly osteoporotic patient was treated elsewhere, but you can see that the second metacarpal shan spin has been not put from the base of the second metacarpal to the base of the third metacarpal. So that is the reason why the, this has acted as a 
uniplanar fixator and due to osteoporosis the both the metacarpal shank spins walked out in this patient so this is the only case where i have seen the metacarpal shank shank spin walking out that is the reason why i said that you have to keep the angle between the shank spins more than 90 degree it should work as a multiplanar fixator if the angle is less than 90 degree it works as a uniplanar fixator and you may not get good result as expected this is my friend dr sambaram he has used this fixator with a badly crushed wound and the plastic surgeon was able to do the flap in spite of the fixator because these are only two shank spin and they were not coming in the way of the flap the doctor has done friends uh, to conclude caro we have message is study the x ray both ap and lateral decide beforehand whether it is stable or unstable pattern keep percutaneous kys and x ray picture ready after close reduction under anesthesia once again judge whether it is stable or unstable if it is stable you just put few percutaneous uh, k wires and apply plaster if unstable it is better to put solapur frame and plating also can be done but that is uh, not the topic i'm going to i'm speaking there is definitely advantage of external fixator or internal fixation so the main advantage i find is this time required to apply the solapur frame is less than even applying a reduction plaster within such a short time we are able to apply four shank spin and apply the fixator so please do try on two cases and send me your results thank you very much great method thank you thank you dr shiv shankar uh, a very nice uh, innovation coming out of necessity i think those innovation coming out of necessity are the most useful and see the day of the light uh, any questions uh, i see one question in the chat box dr shiv shankar are you okay if you take a yeah yeah sure sure dr pankaj jindal has uh, i think asked about the indications uh, would there be any specific indications for the fixator since you are using other modalities also a uh, basically badly comminuted distal and radial fractures can be treated that's main indication and second indication is economical reasons because my patients have to pay from their pocket for the treatment so uh, if they are unable to afford a treatment of plating or internal fixation yes in the same money what i charge for a reduction and percutane fixation i do apply this fixation extra fixator any other question any other comment by any of the faculties and is there any upper limit to the age where, where you feel the the construct or the pins would not work any upper uh, age limit uh, i have not found anything because i have used even 80 85 years old people also basically keeping uh, the first shank spin what we pass from the second metacarpal to the base of the third metacarpal that gives the best basic good stability against which we are distracting so that has to be put properly that is the only thing which is very very necessary and angle between the shank spin which i have been reiterating so many times it has to be more than 90 degree then only it works as a multiplanar fixator is anything the angle between them is less than 90 degree and it will be uniplanar fixator yeah there is a hand raised from dr samir mehta dr samir you want to ask the question yes sir thank you very much sir my question would be uh, sir we often uh, uh, encounter patients who come little late uh, to us maybe in a week or two weeks time so what is the time limit sir till when we can use uh, we can apply fixator in a comminuted distal end of radius Uh, i have shown three cases one was two weeks old and two or three weeks old uh, delayed cases where i applied the fixator in the first case i applied the fixator and i was unable to get the reduction so i dismantled the fixator and over the shank spin only i applied a simple distractor and distracted but nowadays as i said i apply the solapur frame first and over the shank spin i just apply a simple distractor and keep distracting for two days it takes about 3 to 4 days time uh, on table we can distract 50% and remaining 50% gradually you can distract in 2 3 days then you tighten the clamps and take out the fixator so i have used up to 6 weeks time is the maximum all right thank you sir and would there be a case where you feel it would be a contraindication meaning is there a contraindication to this procedure 
I don't think so. It because if instead of a plaster, you can put the fixator anywhere. So I don't think there is a contraindication for an extra fixator. Any other comments from any faculty? Rather, all the indications for any other surgery is an indication for external fixator. Right. But since I am putting only four shell spin, the time required is even less than the. See, if I operate a patient uh, in my hospital, uh, it takes at least half an hour for me to get the anesthesia and uh, apply the plaster, and apply the KVAR. So in that time, definitely I'll fin finish this, and my hospital room will be also tidy without plaster on the floor. So, Dr. Naveen, uh, do you yeah. think it should be patented and it can be patented, this design? Yes, we have to look into the prior art. If somebody has already done something like that or they have reported uh, prior art, that is the most important part. See, what yeah. happens is if you if somebody has done or if it is already known to people, it cannot be patented. I will tell an example of my own. When I did the Solapur broken nail extractor, the reverse thread extractor, I came to Delhi in 2001 for patenting. Then I said that I have done these surgeries in so many other hospitals in Sholapur, Dr. Bandari Hospital, Kotadi Hospital, like that I showed. I showed about 50 cases with the broken L ex extractor. Then they said that since it's already in the public domain, you cannot register yeah. this. This you is what they told. You have to apply first and then publish. Yeah, you have to register the uh, this uh, idea first, then you can go for the patent afterwards. So since the idea has not been registered, and if already somebody has done it, they say that it is in public domain unless you bribe and do the thing properly. <laughs> no, it happened because a lawyer came and asked me, shall I help you? I said no at that time. Right. So if there are no more questions or comments, uh, we can take them maybe even after Dr. Naveen's uh, talk. Uh, I invite Dr. Naveen Thakkar now to present his thoughts on local antibiotic delivery systems. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lalit and uh, Delhi Orthopedic Association for allowing me to share my experience on local antibiotic delivery system. Myths, facts, tips and tricks. First question comes in our mind, why we need local antibiotic delivery system? We all know that there is a biofilm on the implant surface. A biofilm is a structured community of bacterial cells enclosed in a self-produced polymeric matrix and adherent to an inert or a living surface. Gradually from the mono layer here to mature biofilm, it gets layered one and gets a biofilm. There is a special communication system with this bacteria, these microbes, and this communication goes on and they communicate very well. They give signals by special communications. I just can't go with the flow anymore. I have been thinking about joining the biofilm. So gradually, this becomes up to 100 mm thickness. This has been reported in the literature very well. What is the problem? Problem is the genetic mutation, antibiotic resistance with the biofilm, and systemic antibiotic fails to penetrate this system of biofilm. Because we need a very high local MIC level to kill this bacteria. And the problem with the uh, systemic antibiotic is long course of systemic antibiotic is required. Higher dose to get the MIC. And the problem one is systemic side effect. And the second problem area is the compliance with the patient. So local antibiotic delivery system is required to get the higher local MIC level. But what, what is the prerequisite? It requires a good local environment and the envelope. What, what, what is required? The first and foremost requirement is one has to create a healthy defect from the unhealthy defect. Anything which is dead, either it is a bone, it is a, a soft tissue envelope defect, Anything is there, dead, has to go. So the key is debridement, debridement, and debridement. It has to be a ruthless debridement. So everything goes, even the smallest piece of the dead tissue, 
you have to find out and remove everything then and then there is a good environment that was the extramedullary environment at the same time one has to look for the intramedullary environment also if you see the series of the reamer here here is the dirty tissue you can see gradually when you go on reaming the higher size and now you have a relatively good tissue so it is not the extramedullary uh, uh, debridement it is a intramedullary debridement is also also very important in this situation so second principle is one has to obliterate the dead space here you may require a combined approach with your plastic surgeon friend this is the again second prerequisite for uh, treating this type of uh, implant infection and the third requirement is a stabilization reconstruction of bone antibiotic coated implant either it is a metaphysis diaphysis choice of implant depends on that how it works broadly it is a mechanical and biological we all know that there is a rest for the surface for the bacteria if we replace the surface with the antibiotic coating that rest biofilm uh, making will not be there on, on that surface and this rest we can win by changing the our uh, surface there is a contact killing of the bacterial cell direct contact killing with the uh, antibiotic layer and there are far killing by the drug elution by local high mic through the pores with the antibiotic delivery system and that another advantage it it gives the framework for the osteoinduction and osteogenesis in some of the antibiotic delivery system which are they if we broadly classify it it is a non biodegradable bone cement antibiotic what we use routinely it's a bits twisted wire nail skin nail interlock nail flex nail spacer blocks or fillers but the problem with this system is a removal is must debonding is a problem when you are coating on the implant so you have to take care of this problems and another system is biodegradable that is either synthetic that is calcium phosphate that stimulon polyglycan coated protex synthesis which is under trial or natural one we use the bone graft as a local antibiotic delivery system there are biopolymers cytosan blocks they are also under trial and collagen forms seeds are available for a, a high elution for a short time let us see one by one the first uh, we are doing is on the k nail uh, because it it, it 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 is a natural rough uh, uh, surface and the curvature here is a small tip this is a small video you can see that i have taken a two bowls one for the monomer and the polymer and another one for the antibiotic powder so wait for the 30 seconds after combining monomer and polymer and then pour the antibiotic powder this is done for preventing the trapping of the antibiotic molecules in the early polymerization that is the only idea so this is a small tip to get the good elution of the antibiotic so tip is wait for 30 seconds and uh, to mixing the antibiotic myth is can take any random amount of antibiotic no for coating of the implant the fact is 10% of the cement volume you can take the antibiotic if you are taking a 4 g antibiotic pack or uh, uh, 40 g pack of the cement you can take 4 g if you are 20 g then you can take a 2 g of total antibiotic whatever antibiotic you want to mix in it has to be Uh, it it has to be a, in the powder form you cannot mix the liquid anti antibiotic and it should be thermostable because you are you going to use with the cement that is the principle that is a fact after making this with the antibiotic then you apply on the surface of the k nail here is the example video of the k nail how it is done on the k nail once you apply on this then you have to make it uh, equal by rolling on the this plastic sheet you can see in this video that you have to roll on the sterile plastic sheet to make it a even or almost a round shape of the nail then after making this what we do is we check the diameter of the uh, this vanco nail 
we routinely use vancomycin and meropenem uh, uh, in this antibiotic nail. We do extra procedure uh, of chiseling of this bone cement on the nail surface. This serves two purposes. The first purpose is we exactly know how much is the bonding there. If easily gets chiseled out, then it is going to be deboned. And second thing is wherever there are concretions, where do you feel that there, there are too much of the bone cement, you can remove it and you can have a, a different diameter at different level so that in the proximal part it may be a higher diameter because of the proximal canal is voluminous so you can make it accordingly customize your, your diameter also uh, differential diameter this is the one case where the there was an infection and after removal of the routine interlock nail this was the frank non-union here rimmed it biofilm is removed by uh, rimming and irrigation of the intramural environment till this you get this type of the bone graft from the inside and this bone graft will also be useful by putting there with the local antibiotic delivery system and you have to hammer gradually <coughs> this nail do not try to rotate much on the key nail because they, that will create a little bit of debonding later on so hammer gradually uh, uh, inside the canal Another case, surgeon has done interlock nailing. Again, it is waiting for the union. It is getting loosened out. Again, failing. You can see that interlock is failing. There is a mechanical problem, uh, the surgeon thought. So he did exchange nailing with a wide diameter nail and another interlocking uh, uh, screws here. And waited, waited after the exchange nailing. But that was also failing uh, like this. So what he tried, he did another exchange nailing with the another nail and he rimmed and he put a bone graft here also with a small window. But again it is failing. So many times we do not know. So we opened up this when it presented to us and we found this much of the thick bar film intermetal layers. So we have to open up everything and we have to remove anything which is dead. We cannot do a, a repeated surgery without this and it, it may be a repeated surgery which has led to a localized low-grade infection and that, that was preventing the union. And here we made a K-nail but we thought that only the K-nail is not giving a good rotational stability uh, with the, uh, this implant. So we use the plate also and here the tip is and you can see within a time because of the local environment is improved and there is a good stability it has started uniting very well so stability with the knl was also a problem in certain uh, comminuted fracture so we may have to augment with the uh, plate and here the tip is plate can also be cement coated in the middle part of this and the both the ends you can put the screws here this is a special plate banana safe uh, for the femur so that anterior curvature is also accommodated very well and you can fix on the both the sides. Another case, after the experience with this, where it was a uh, lower end of the uh, tibia fracture, which was treated in an another state with the external fixator and infection, the bone was exposed here. When we took the history, we found that surgeon tried to put a nail and this has exploded like anything while the reaming. So this was the uh, presenting uh, film x-rays. So we planned for a customized nail. So we measured the nail size. We made a customized interlock nail with such crisscross design on the surface to prevent the debonding. Because here in the metaphysical region with a very short segment, we cannot have a K nail and we cannot put a, uh, this plate with the tibia because the tissues are exposed. So we made an antibiotic nail, customized, and we fixed up with multiple locking distally also. And at the same sitting, the plastic surgeon did a, a flap, local flap. And this is the uniting. And this is the function. So we can go uh, with the debridement. And if you are sure that your debridement is OK and your plastic surgeon is with you, you can do it one stage with the antibiotic nail and, and, and this interlocking stability. 
the fat is more debonding with the smooth nail and less debonding with the rough nail. That has to be kept in the mind when you are using the antibiotic delivery system. Stimulant kits are available, particularly for the cavity and not for the stability uh, purpose. And what we found is the cost of the 5 gram is around 13,000 to 15,000 and 10 gram is 25,000. Amount of the antibiotic which you can make with the stimulant, uh, these pellets, the structure gets disturbed if you put a more antibiotic. And certain antibiotics takes a lot of time to uh, make the pellets. And if it is mixed with the blood, it becomes a paste. What we do in that place, we use a bone graft a, a, as a local antibiotic delivery system. Another case, very unstable fracture, open fracture, fixed with intramural and extramural implant. Later on, we put a bone graft with the local antibiotic. The bone graft is imbibed in the an antibiotic, uh, this powder, and that is kept for 30 minutes. And that has been delivered at the local site. Another case, fixation was done by the surgeon for proximal tibia. You can see here. And this was the presentation at, at the time it presented to us. It was infected. So we removed all the implants, debrided thoroughly at the first stage, and weighed a twisted wire like this with the tension bend. And this can serve as a good uh, uh, encourage for the antibiotic bits. And later on, we use only bone graft as the local antibiotic delivery system. But because the patient was fed up with the uh, other treatments. And here, this is the only local antibiotic delivery system is the bone graft and the plaster support. And gradually, as the environment improves and you provide a good uh, graft there with antibiotic delivery. Myth with us, what is taught previously with us, the antibiotic will kill the osteogenicity. But that is not the case. If you read the literature, it affects the osteoblast only at the more than 1000 MIC level of the antibiotic, particularly on that spot. And that too also temporary for one week only. Later on, the osteoblast works as usual. Only advantage with the antibiotic with the bone graft is you can use any antibiotic. You did not require to have a thermostable antibiotic with the bone graft. Whatever the sensitivity report you get, you can use that antibiotic with that. Another uh, uh, patient, multiple surgery, non-union, femur, all antibiotic delivery system as used antibiotic cement plug. You can see here antibiotic cement nail and the antibiotic cement bits. After thorough debridement and completely removing uh, all the tissues. And the second stage, the bone cement plug was removed and this graft was used and it has given a beautiful healing. Another method. When there is a late presentation of the patient with tibia particularly, we use a flexible nails primarily with the antibiotic coating like this. We make a small cuts on the surface of this flexible nail and coat with the antibiotic cement solution like this. And this can be used and you can see that the flexibility is retained if you coat like that not more than 1 mm or less than 1 mm, the flexibility of the flexible nail retains. And you can fix it with this. At the same time, you can flap it also because it's an unrim thing and, and, and that will give a coverage. So myths with us many times, we get the culture reports and there we see that certain antibiotics are not sensitive. and we cannot use because the, uh, the which sensitive antibiotics are not thermostable. But the, what we have experienced is non-sensitive thermostable antibiotics are really acting at that local MIC level. What we see in the laboratory reports is a different MIC level testing. So what, whatever is bacteriostatic on a laboratory report becomes a bacteriocidal with the local high MIC level. So we should not be uh, uh, worried about that using vancomycin or meropenem as a powder form thermostable. We may not get the sensitivity report of that same, but the MIC level is different in the both the setups of the laboratory level and, and what we do practically uh, on table. 
So non-sensitive is also effective at the higher MIC level. That that was the fact. Another myth with the this antibiotic uh, K nail is no need to remove the nail. No, it has to be removed. And second surgery has to be done with the local uh, this uh, uh, routine interlock nailing once your infection is cleared up. So many times the patient presents like this, they have retained the smaller diameter of the nail because with the K nail we use a smaller diameter to have a coating on that. And here the nail broke. So always the message is one has to remove the uh, at the stipulated time the antibiotic nail. Patient should be explained very well to remove the this antibiotic nail. Uh, there are many examples where we had a very difficult to remove these antibiotic nails and we have to slit the uh, tibia uh, because of the uh, time constraint. I will, I am not showing that cases. Another antibiotic delivery system is collagen, uh, this uh, uh, swaps. It is a very rapid elution. It is mainly used in the spine surgery. Thank you very much for your kind listening. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Naveen, for an excellent uh, deliberation on a very, very important topic. I think infection is a nightmare for all orthopedic surgeons in any field of orthopedics. And very clearly uh, detailed uh, various facts and certain nice uh, tips on how to manage this. So any questions uh, from anybody or any comments from the faculty who's on board? So I think uh, the radical debridement part uh, was a very, very important message that you detailed. Uh, people have gone on to comment that it is almost like uh, uh, managing a malignant tumor and uh, you have to be radical about it. Yeah. And uh, the masculine technique has also now come in, which is also giving, giving us more uh, utility about this uh, antibiotic spacer and telling us that uh, it also gives us a membrane. <laughs> So many good cells. Dr. Shiv Shankar, any comment from your side? You are muted, sir. Dr. Shiv Shankar, you are muted. Yeah, very excellently covered all the uh, aspects which is required and uh, uh, what he was telling at the MIC level in a non-sensitive, it is actually uh, even the antibiotic if it is non-sensitive, but the, it works as a chemical, basically. It's a, it kills the bacteria because of its high concentration at the local delivery system. Yeah, very well covered. Thank you. Thank you. Any other faculty, any comment? Uh, actually, the comments and questions which are coming. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Harmesh. Uh, good morning, Dr. Shivikankar, sir. Uh, I have a question uh, for you. Uh, my personal feeling is that when we put a lot of pins, it leads to more chances of RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, versus a ORIF with a plate. What is your take on that? Uh, see, I have seen major majority of my cases who have got oh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy are unfortunately patients with a crack fracture where I have treated with plaster. I don't know. Displaced fracture patients hardly get RSD in, in uh, I have seen RSD. So that is the, my personal observation. Regarding cases with external fixator, if I had kept the fixator more than six weeks in distracted position because patient doesn't come even in spite of my repeated telling that it has to be done. So if, in such cases, I have seen that the there is a resorption of the bone, there is a pain in the hand, it may not be full picture of a reflex sympathetic dystrophy with the shoulder hand syndrome, but at least in the wrist and hand, there will be pain, there will be redness. So I always insist that at four weeks, I have to release the distraction. So maximum, I keep the distraction even in badly comminuted fractures for about five weeks, not more than that. Yes, Dr. Anil Bhatt has got a question. So just, just a comment on the external fixator and RSD. Uh, most of the time you get uh, the CRPS kind of features uh, when there is excess distraction. If you look at Dr. Shivshankar's x-ray, you would always see that the, the distraction is 
enough, it's not excessive. So if you see the spaces between the intercarpal bones in some of the x-rays, they look quite wide. And between the radiocarpal joint and the carpal bones. So those are the patients where there is a lot of stretching of soft tissues. There is the venous return is damaged and, all, and also kept for a long time. These are the patients very prone for uh, CRPS or RST. If your distraction is not so much, and as uh, Sir has showed the gradual distraction later on also, I think that that will reduce the features of uh, CRP. Yes, Dr. Naveen. Yes, we have shifted to uh, non-sparing uh, uh, joint, uh, non-sparing uh, external fixators with this, with our own uh, economical model of putting K wires just in the uh, two corners of the radius, both sides, and then band the K wire and put a external fixator there, not on the metacarpal side. Uh, and no distraction. Uh, that is the uh, solution we, we found for uh, economical solution for a uh, poor patients. And for uh, very combinative fracture, we do a bridge pleating. Uh, if you want to go to the metacarpal, then we do the bridge pleating. And that is not giving that much of uh, RST or problem. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kotwal has something to say. Dr. Kotwal, sir. Uh, yes, I I agree with um, Anil. You know there are two issues about the development of RST with an external fixator. One is the excessive distraction, very rightly uh, pointed out. And the second thing is the duration of uh, this thing. He also mentioned about it, but there is a lot of literature which says that if the uh, duration of the external fixator is more than six weeks with distraction, excessive distraction then it leads to uh, RST, development of RST. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think uh, infection and lower end radius are always burning topic, and I'm sure we'll be coming back to these topics through the day as we go with uh, further talks. I would uh, thank uh, from the bottom of my heart both uh, Dr. Shiv Shankar and Dr. Naveen Thakkar to sparing their time, and more than that, sparing their thoughts, their knowledge, their experience, and their innovations. Thank you so much, and we'll close down uh, this session, and I will hand it back uh, to the organizers. I assume Dr. Harmesh Kapoor would uh, take over the next session. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Lalit Mani, sir. Uh, it has been actually the main um, hard work has been done by Dr. Lalit Mani and Dr. Hitesh in making this meeting successful. And uh, I also thank Dr. Shiv Shankar, Dr. Tucker, sir, to spare some time for this meeting. And I welcome all the faculty for the next sessions. Uh, the most practical topics which a general surgeon, orthopedic surgeon sees are going to be covered in this session. And we have very, very eminent faculty here uh, with us today in the form of Dr. Sandeep Saina. Uh, he is a associate professor at uh, uh, Sabdajang Hospital. Central Institute of Orthopedics, and he will be talking on how to take and read risk X-rays. So we'll start with the basics. Uh, can I ask Dr. Uh, Sandeep to please start sharing his uh, screen? Display settings and display settings. Yes, go on the display setting and uh, yeah. remove the uh, presenter yeah. view. Presenter, you don't or reverse it. Display settings. Uh, I, I hope I'm audible to the audience. Yes, but uh, yours is a, yours is a presenter view. So we are seeing the next slide also. It should be reverse. Display okay. setting. Just click the display settings in the middle of the top. Upper, upper, upper. Huh. Upper, upper. Huh. 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 Yes. Duplicate slide so or swap, whatever. If you need a okay. Yeah, I hope I'm audible right now. Yeah, yes, okay. Dr. So, a very good morning to all the eminent faculty present over here. I am Dr. Sandeep Shaina, and today I'll be talking about the radiography of the wrist, how to take and read x-rays of the wrist. 
well to start off the history of the wrist x-rays is the history of x-rays itself the very first x-ray which mr william f ronson took was an x-ray of the wrist and hand of his wife and even the first fracture which was diagnosed on an x-ray was a colis fracture which was a fracture of the wrist so you can understand the importance of wrist x-rays in the history of x-rays so uh, starting off first first uh, first of all when we take a wrist x ray we all, we all know that we all have to take an x ray in two views another important point is that we often order x rays in an ap view well for the wrist it's always a pa view rather than the ap view the standard series of wrist x rays are uh, pa pa with ulnar deviation a lateral view and an oblique view and the stand, standard series of hand and fingers are a pa oblique and a lateral view. Now, how to take a proper wrist X-ray? As I've told earlier, the two primary views are PA and lateral. So, in this, we have to make sure that the shoulder and the elbow are at the same level or at the same height. The elbow is should be flexed to around 90 degrees. The hand should be pronated, and the finger should be extended, and the uh, beam should be actually pointed to the head of the cavity. So that is the proper way how to take a pa view so how do we know that it is a pa view when uh, we can see that the cmc joints should all be profiled there should be no pore shortening of the metacarpals and the wrist should be in extension the uh, long axis of the third metacarpal capitate and the radius should all be in a straight line Another important thing which we have to see is the ulnar staloid. Uh, in the next slide, you can see in this X-ray, the uh, ulnar staloid is arising from the center of the ulna. This means that the X-ray has been taken in an AP view. In a proper PA view, the ulnar staloid is the most ulnar structure which we see. This is very important because our uh, measurement of ulnar variance will always depend upon the ulnar staloid being the most ulnar structure. Now, another important thing is look for the ECU groove. The, uh, when, the, when the ECU groove is not just radial to the ulnar staloid, we can make out that the, that the elbow and the shoulder were not at the uh, same level. The ECU groove should be just below are just radial to the fovea. The fovea is the attachment of the uh, TFCC. If the group of the EC overlaps the ulnar staloid, it usually means that the elbow is at the lower level than the shoulder. Now, how to take a true lateral view? A true lateral view of the wrist is best taken with the elbow flexed 90 degrees and the, and the upper limb totally adducted against the trunk. How do we make out that the X-ray is a true lateral view? We have to see the alignment of the carpal, the capitate, and the radius. All these should be uh, in a straight line as shown in the uh, corresponding picture. As you can see, the metacarpals, the capitate, and the radius all are in a straight line. Now. Uh, another important thing which we can look for while uh, 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 asserting that it is a proper lateral view is the relationship of the scaphoid fibrosity, the palmar aspect of the pisiform, and the palmar aspect of the capitate. Uh, in the above, in the above uh, picture, you can see that the, the, this is the uh, scaphoid, the palmar surface of the scaphoid fibrosity. This is the pisiform, and this is the capitate. Now the uh, the palmar surface of the pisiform should be just midway between the palmar surface of the capitate and the palmar surface of the uh, scaphoid. Now, this is known as the SP la uh, SPC lateral, which is the proper, which is a, a way to find out if the view is properly laterally placed or not. Now, how do you determine that the wrist has been pronated or supinated during a uh, during you know when, when when taking a lateral view? Well, if the wrist is supinated, you can see the pisiform as the most volar structure in the wrist. That means that the wrist has been supinated. Now, when the wrist is pronated, 
you can easily profile the uh, ST joint and the uh, first CMC joint and the scaphoid uh, and the scaphoid fibrosity. This is also known as an oblique pronated view, which will be required in when we talk about the uh, series of the scaphoid. Now, coming to the scaphoid series, what all important views are there in the scaphoid series? First of all, the most important view which we have to look for is the PA view in ulnar deviation, followed by a lateral view, followed by a 45 degree pronation oblique view, a 45 degree supination oblique view, and the last but not least, the banana view. The upper three views are the most important, which should be included in every scaphoid series. The last two views can be uh, can be useful if you know if we cannot figure out where the fracture is. So how do you take these? As we all know, while taking a PA uh, PA uh, PA ulnar deviation view, the scaphoid will totally extend, and that is important to look for fractures which are in the waist. The uh, the scaphoid is normally uh, volarly tilted to around 40 to 60 degrees. When we do ulnar deviation, the scaphoid extends and it exposes the fracture of the waist. Now, when we take a 45 degree pronation oblique view, as I've said earlier, it can profile the distal scaphoid pole and the uh, scaphoid tuberosity. A semi supinated 45 degree oblique view will allow us to study the proximal pole. And a lateral view will help us in detecting the fracture of tuberosity or the displacement of the waist. Now, this is the last view, which is known also known as a banana view. When uh, while taking the banana view, we have to actually dorsiflex the wrist uh, by around 30 degree, or we have to angle the uh, angle the X-ray beam around 30 degrees towards the elbow. It profiles the scaphoid in such a way that the entire length of the scaphoid is visible as as you as you would see in a banana. So these are the uh, basic views for scaphoid. Uh, I hope I'll take questions later after this lecture. Now, <clears throat> what is the importance of an AP view? The AP view is useful in detecting scapholunate diastasis. A clenched fist view is, is one in which we clench the fist and the capitate draws proximally into the scapholunate space, creating a, creating a space, creating an opening in the proximal carpal row. Now, this is commonly known as the uh, Terry Thomas sign. But we have to be careful that sometimes the intercarpal space is can be uh, can be different in different individuals. We'll always have to compare it with the opposite wrist. Now, how do we how do we detect a carpal collapse? A carpal collapse can be uh, detected by a carpal uh, carpal height ratio, which is the ratio of the carpal height by the length of the third metacarpal. It is normally 0 0.51 to 0 0.57. Any collapse in the carpus, which can be either due to teen box disease, rheumatoid arthritis, or SLAC, can be detected by ascertaining the carpal height ratio. Now, we all know about the Gilula's arcs. There are three basic arcs. The first arc is the most proximal one, which, uh, which, uh, which, which is along the proximities, proximal convexities of the scaphoid, lunate, and the triquitrum. The second arc is the distal convex surface of the scaphoid lunate and triquitrum. And the third arc follows the main proximal curvature of capitate and hamate. Carpal dissociation will lead to breaking of the gilula's arc, as you can see in this X-ray. Now, how do we detect intercalated segment instability? By looking at the scapholunate angle. Up, uh, upon which we can decide if the injury is a BIC or a BC. The normal scaffold unit angle is around 30 to uh, 60 degrees, and it is measured as shown in the picture. And a normal capital unit angle is around uh, 0 to 30 degrees. A DC will occur in the cases of scaphoid fractures or scaffold unit ligament rupture. Uh, capital uh, as uh, and here the in here the capital uh, in the, in here the scaphoid capital uh, the scaphoid lunate angle becomes greater than 60 degrees because the lunate uh, lunate tilts dorsally a bc in which the lunate tilts morally is normally seen in the uh, mm -hmm. in uh, luno triquitral injury now how do we ascertain perilunate instability and dislocation 
Now in this X-ray, you can see that the lunate is snugly uh, fitted in the lunate fossa of the radius, and the capitate has moved dorsally. Now this is classic case of uh, perilunate instability. The lunate being at its place, the, it being the interplated fragment, and the capitate uh, uh, dislo uh, dislocating dorsally. This is known as uh, this is known as perilunate uh, perilunate dislocation. This is the case of lunate dislocation. The lunate has gone out of the uh, lunate fossa of the radius and it has tilted volarly, which is also known as a spilled teacup sign. And a lunate dislocation or a perilunate dislocation can also pr uh, present in a uh, PA view as a piece of pi or a triangular lunate sign. Now, this is. Uh, this is, I wanted to include this because many times when we are doing plating of the distal end of radius, we cannot detect whether the screws have penetrated the uh, radiocarpal joint or not. Now, since the uh, uh, since the radius in its normal anatomy is palmarly tilted to around 11 degrees, when we take an X-ray in the uh, exact uh, when we place our hand exactly PA on the cassette. Uh, there will always be, uh, you know, the palmar cortex, which will be more uh, distal as compared to the dorsal cortex. If we, if we tilt our uh, wrist in such a way by 11 degrees, then the palmar and the dorsal cortex will be in the same line and we can detect an, any small penetration of screw in the uh, radiocarpal joint. Similarly, since the radial inclination is around 23 degrees, if well, while keeping our hand laterally on a cassette, if we tilt our wrist, uh, you know, we tilt our wrist, we can detect, we can uh, get the uh, radial, uh, we can get the radial salad process out of the way, and we can detect any screw penetration in the uh, lateral view as well. Now, uh, also while interoperatively, we'll have to we have to detect any screw penetration on the dorsal cortex. For that, we have to place the uh, wrist and the forearm as shown in the picture, and we have to angle the uh, we have to angle our wrist and the forearm in such a way that there is a 15 degree angulation uh, between the wrist and the X-ray beam, so that we can detect any dorsal penetration of the screw, in uh, which can you know further harm the extensor tendons. This way, this is the way. Uh, it is taken, and this is the view we get after that, in which we can see the lister tubercle and the scoop penetration, the slight scoop penetration in the dorsal cortex. Now, this is another view which is known as the carpal tunnel view. It is, uh, it is, it is done by keeping the uh, keeping the maximally dorsiflexed wrist on the uh, X-ray cassette, and then uh, directing the beam at along 25 degrees to the uh, polar aspect. To a point 2.5 distal to the base of the fourth metacarpal to detect uh, fracture, uh, fractures of the hook, um, uh, hook of hamate or palmar aspects of trapezium scaphoid fibrosity, etc. Now, this is a special view which is known as the Roberts view. The Roberts view is uh, used, used for taking a proper AP view of the thumb, which uh, in which we uh, which can help us utilize, you know, visualize the base of the first metacarpal, the first CMC joint, and the ST joint. The uh, in it, you can, as you can see, the dorsum of the thumb is uh, placed totally on the cassette, uh, placed in the cassette with maximum hyperpronation of the forearm. Now, uh, coming to the views of the hand, uh, again, there's a the hand should be pronated, it should light fly it on a cassette, and the x ray beam should be head, uh, centered over the head of the first of the third metacarpal. Now, uh, the other standard views which we take are the uh, oblique. Uh, oblique view, it, uh, which helps us visualizing all the metacarpals at the same time, and the and the uh, proper lateral view because they overlap each other. That is not very helpful, so we have to take a oblique view. Now another uh, another thing is uh, when is known as a bicondylar sign, is, uh, that when the phalangeal fractures occurs with the rotational deformity, the condyles will not overlap each other as uh, as perfectly as in a lateral view, which is known as a bicondylar sign. And we can know that the X-ray has been taken a bit early. So thank you for uh, patient listening. Uh, these are my references. Thank you. And I'll take any questions now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, it was, in, in fact, a very uh, 
comprehensive list of x-rays probably not practically possible for each patient but you have uh, very rightly pointed out which patient should be given which views uh, i think we'll take the question in mind now i invite uh, dr anil bhat for uh, his talk he is going to talk us about scaphoid fractures management including the mis everybody knows he knows needs no introduction but just briefly i may tell you that he is professor and head of department of hand surgery uh, manipal hospital he is associate dean of that hospital special interest in hand arthroscopy congenital hand uh, re- tendon reconstructions and he is also a clinical editor of hand american society for surgery of the hand and a chief editor for journal of karnataka orthopedic association he has many phd students under him he has more than 80 international and national publications he is author of one book and co-author in two uh, other books and he has more than 350 guest lectures 26 academic awards six phd theses and six fellowships to be very briefly introducing him i think if we start introducing him the whole 10 minutes will go in that so i invite dr bhat and i thank him for sparing his time for this meeting thank you sir please all yours thank you thank you so much sir for that uh, i'm not able to share the screen because there's another yeah thank you is my screen visible yes doctor yes sir yeah. thank you so much thanks to delhi orthopedic association for this wonderful opportunity uh, dr lalit vikas uh, dr harmendra now the decision making in scaphoid fractures uh, is very very crucial the diagnosis itself becomes very crucial because uh, this is a fracture which can be missed by anyone uh, at, at any point of time during the patient management at each stage of the patient management and the delay in the treatment leads to obviously poor prognosis because the complications are quite detrimental for the joint function eventually leading to a gross degenerative arthritis of the wrist joint itself now the most important thing to start off would be the history itself most patients come with a fallen or outstretched hand uh complaints predominantly for radial sided wrist pain so if patient doesn't have any distal radius fractures uh, the next thing should always rule out is scaphoid fracture and the next thing should be ruled out is a scaphoid ligament injury so these are the common ones on a radial sided wrist pain but many patients may not also complain of much pain uh, in especially in scaphoid fracture there might not be a lot of swelling a lot of pain some pain initially so this is the, probably the first step again where patients delay in coming to us so these are not neglected fractures or these are not missed fractures but these are only patient coming to us late and sometimes not coming at all and then scaphoid is not just made of its waste we have been always taught tenderness in anatomical snuff box but scaphoid is a big bone in the scaphoid uh, in the in the carpal bones and it spans both the proximal and the distal rows so the ulnar part here the, the distal part or the distal pole of the tuberosity is actually palpated on the ulnar side along the fcr tendon and the proximal pole is palpated on the dorsal side so if you see now both lateral ulnar and dorsal all the areas have to be palpated for all three parts of the scaphoid the base the distal pole and the proximal pole uh, for us to have an idea whether which part is injured so it's not a waste is a common site but then other areas could also be injured so very very important to add to that if you add some provocative tests like this metacarpal grinding test or is resisted supination kind of test sometimes it can yield your clinical examination to give the diagnosis much more correct set of x rays are crucial already this has been spoken about so the wrist pa lateral and pa in ulnar deviation is very very important so these are the three basic x rays anybody should always take when the suspect of uh, fracture scaphoid you can add the oblique views uh, uh, to see the proximal pole or the distal pole or the stt joint itself so having this five will increase the sensitivity and the specificity to almost 100% if you have these five x rays whenever you suspect you don't have to do it in all patients but when you suspect a scaphoid fracture definitely have to do uh, these five x rays now coming to scenario where x rays their fracture line may not be visible or fracture line is visible so these are the two scenarios you come with after you take the x rays now if the fracture line is visible it could be undisplaced fracture or a displaced fracture both have their own consequences i'll come to that later 
Now, the first one, fracture line is not visible. What do we do? The classic teaching is you put them on a slab or a cast. If you're suspecting scaphoid fracture, repeat the x-ray after 10 days or to two weeks. And then uh, if the fracture line becomes visible, which is basically because of the osteoclastic activity, continue with the cast. So this is the classic uh, you know, teaching all of us have gone through. But a lot of times patients do not want to wait for the two weeks uh, you know, of slab or a cast. So then second line should always be an MRI. And the MRI will give that fracture edema and changes in the uh, fracture uh, area uh, very nicely, which has got a very high degree of sensitivity and specificity. So if patient is not willing for that, straight away ask for an MRI. This also will pick up other injuries, soft tissue injuries like a scaphalonate ligament injury or any such. Uh, so these are called occult fractures, basically, where fracture line is not visible on X-ray. And then follow the same protocol as undisplaced K4 fracture. If fracture line is not uh, visible, I mean, seen even on MRI, treat it as soft tissue injuries, uh, three weeks of uh, immobilization, and then start mobilizing them. The second is fracture line is visible, but it's undisplaced. So the question now comes is, is it a stable fracture or not for an operating surgeon for us to know whether stable fractures would go for conservative management and an unstable fracture would go for an operative management. So in scaphoid, even a millimeter displacement is an unstable situation. So very, very important. Lateral intra-scaphoid angle, normally there's an angle of about 24 degrees. If it is something more than 35, you should be thinking there is a fracture and a humpback kind of a deformity. Bone loss, combination, proximal pole fractures inherently are unstable. There's no role for conservative management here. And then a DC alignment uh, is again unstable situation, a perilunate fracture dislocation. All these are unstable situations and they require further care, uh, probably in terms of surgery. So if you have an undisplaced stable fracture, as I said, they go for conservative management. SK4 cast is good enough. Uh, just a below the short thumb spikers uh, kind of a cast, IP joint can be left free and wrist in neutral position. So there's no controversies on this. So this is the, way, the classic way of immobilizing it. And we follow up at six weeks with x-rays. And a lot of times it will heal nicely. 89 to 90% of these fractures will heal nicely as long as they're undisplaced, they are stable and are at the waist. So they will heal nicely. But if it is not healed, you see some gap there. Clinically, there is tenderness. What next? Uh, most of the time, that is the time we take CT scan. And CT scan is there for uh, to look at the fracture configuration itself. So what we are looking at is the way we ask for the CT scan in these patients, you should ask for one millimeter cuts in the axis of the longitudinal axis of the scaphoid, very, very important. So that is very important. You don't, so you don't want to miss the fracture line. The standard X-ray cuts are taken at three millimeters. So you should ask for one millimeter cuts and fracture gap is to be seen because that is the most crucial part for us to see whether it, patient requests to be continued in a cast or you have to undergo, a patient has to undergo surgery. So we usually ask for a gap uh, at the CT scan, and if the literature has shown that if the gap is less than two millimeters, you can immobilize for further two weeks, and they most of the time heal well. If the gap is more than two millimeters, uh, we go for conservative, I mean, a percutaneous headless uh, screw fixation, and this is called as an aggressive conservative treatment. So at six weeks, we take a decision. We don't wait further. If the gap is more than two millimeters with a CT scan we tell the patient for a percutaneous headless screw fixation. So this is what we do. We ask the radiologist to give us that gap, and that is very, very important. Percutaneous technique, classically for waist fractures, if you see, difficult to access the distal part of the scaphoid because the trapezium comes in the way. You need to dorsiflex the wrist nicely in that manner so that you get almost a central axis. Very difficult from, from the volar side. From the dorsal side, you can get the central axis very easily, but not so much in the volar side. Now, uh, percutaneous fixation, the most important step is to get that axis. Very, very important. We need to spend a lot of time to get that correct axis, the entry point where the guide wire can go in. So drawing a line in the AP and in the lateral and that intersecting point is the point where your uh, entry point goes. So check thoroughly with your this one. You can always use a 14 gauge needle like this, and you can just pin here under the uh, articular surface, and that can be used as a sleeve for your guide wire. Otherwise, you can just use it freehand. So that junction where these both axes met is the place where your entry point goes. Again, repeatedly keep checking so that you place the wire as center as possible. 
avoid too many passes, too many false tracks. So spend a little more time when you go in slowly. Screen if you require 360 degrees to make sure because every other procedure later happens over this guide wire. So make sure that your guide wire is right in the center as much as possible. It's not, you know, going anywhere else. And if you want, you can screen the whole thing and check and then take a decision. After that, make a small incision there. Use an artery forceps to spread the soft tissues there. And then measure the length of the scaphoid using this measuring depth. This is one of the systems I use. So we usually minus about five millimeters, four to five millimeters from this measurement, what we get because scaphoid is completely covered by articular cartilage. Plus there might be a fracture gap. So minusing all these usually about four to five millimeters. We can drill the distal cortex here. Uh, also sometimes the bone is very hard. You can drill through and through. And then this compression sleeve is the one which is used initially. This will make sure that it, the screw acts like a lax screw now. So the, the system has this compression screw driver here. The sleeve is fixed to the screw here. And as you go in, it just goes to just about the scaphoid. You know, it's not, it's almost flush with the scaphoid, but the, the, the screw has to go inside. So there's another screwdriver for you to compress the screw itself. And that's got about three markings here, the, the green, the yellow, and the red here. So as you go in, uh, when it comes to the yellow, it's completely in flush with the articular surface there. And if it goes towards the red, it means that the screw is buried two millimeters inside the scaphoid. So this is how this system, particular system works, uh, but there are many other systems which you can use. So make sure the, the screw is seated nicely in both the sides, use the correct lens screw. So it doesn't penetrate either in the STT joint or in the radiocarpal joint. Very, very crucial for you to check this. So that is just an example of a closed reduction and percutaneous fixation. Sometimes KYs are used in multi-trauma situations or sometimes when you have multiple fractures or open fractures, but otherwise the headless screw has become a standard. Dorsal approach, especially for proximal pole fractures is used. The screw can be placed in central axis. And so if you do a mini open, you can use C also the scaphalonate ligament. Only problem here is the wrist needs to be hyperflex for you to get the axis here and so that it can sometimes displace the fracture. So percutaneous technique can be used without with an arthroscopic assist, or you can also use a mini open technique with a joystick. So this is classically for a proximal pole, we use the dorsal approach. As I said, the wrist has to be hyperflexed here. The same 14 gauge needle can be used as a sleeve here. The axis is formed by when you hyperflex, you have the distal pole and the proximal pole overlapping each other, almost like a double ring sign. So that is your entry point here. And that is where this guide wire goes. Because you can't uh, you know, extend this joint because it's hyperflexed, it's transfixing, you can't take the lateral view. So you have to go out here near the metacarpal, withdraw the wire completely so it's in flush now here at the proximal pole. Then only now you can extend the wrist and take a lateral view check for the views. You can use another view like a derotation kind of a wire here. And then the screw is passed from uh, proximal pole to distal pole. So that's how it is at the end of this. If you don't get that access properly, you can do a mini open technique. That is a better way of doing it initially, at least in the practice. You can make a small incision. Just this is the scaphalonic junction here. You can visualize the proximal pole and the steps are the same again, measuring and this compression screw and the small cartilage defect left there after this technique. Reduction by joystick, again, in a displaced fracture, minimally displaced, you don't want to open, but still you want to do percutaneous, you can use the joysticks here. Two wires like this, the threaded wires can be used. And this is the maneuver how we uh, reduce the fracture like this. Once it becomes reduced like this, then you can do the percutaneous technique. So you can still do this even in a minimally displaced fracture. The second scenario where fracture line is visible right from the beginning, but it's also displaced like this, the best is to get a CT scan done at that time. If you are seeing the fracture, always get a CT scan. And if it is displaced, you can either you can do a close reduction percutaneous if you can reduce it like the way I showed, either a joystick method, or you go for an open reduction. So that is the option we have. And sometimes patient comes after two weeks or three weeks, there could be a role for a primary bone graft. So acute displaced fractures not reduced by close reduction. You can go for open technique. And of course, comminuted acute fractures, again, go for open technique. Now, people are getting trained with arthroscopy, wrist arthroscopy. So there is a role for arthroscopic assisted reduction. It's not routinely done. So definitely should not be taken as a routine procedure. 
Uh, for displaced fracture, if you still want to do percutaneous fixation, now there is an option where you can go through the arthroscope, reduce the fracture and hold it and then do the percutaneous fixation. Or in delayed presentations, you can still you know, shave off all the fibrous tissue and everything and still do this. So this is a, a, just an example how the approach is. The approach is actually in the mid-carpal joint here, not in the radiocarpal joint. So I'm in the mid-carpal joint here. This is the capitate here. This is a scaphoid here. And then I'm reaching the, this is the fracture site here. This patient came, uh, I think two or three weeks later, there was some amount of fibrous tissue here. So that's where we use this technique. So you can go in there. So this is the fracture site you can see. This is the capitate on the site. And this is the scaphoid there. You just have to probe that and just try to break open that fibrous tissue there. And then you can use a shaver so that you can remove all these fibrous tissue and then continue with the percutaneous technique. So this is how, again, I stress that it is not done routinely. Very rarely we do that, but it is an option. It's a skill which somebody wants to learn it. Definitely, it's a useful technique. So shave off this area, make it fresh, uh, you know, bleed, uh, bleeding happens, and then you can do the percutaneous technique. So in summary, a good clinical and radiological evaluation is very, very important so that we don't miss these fractures. If you don't see a fracture, always get an MRI as a second line of investigation. But if you see a fracture, get a CT done so that you know the fracture personality or the pattern, the displacement and all these the combination so that you take a decision on fixation. Aggressive conservative management, that is, which at six weeks you take a CT, measure the gap and make sure you go for, advise the patient for early surgery, definitely increases the chances for union. And percutaneous technique conserves the fracture biology, so it's good that we learn this technique uh, now onwards. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bird, sir. I think it can be more vivid than this. Uh, such a difficult topic, uh, made so simple and looks so simple by your presentation. I'm sure we all have learned a lot in this. Uh, Thank you, going, sir. yeah, Doctor Doctor Amit, uh, Larry, you want to say something, sir? Um, yes. No, no, it's okay. I'm just waiting for the second. Yeah. So uh, now I think we'll take all the questions in the end. So going forward, we have Doctor Amitabh Lehri. He is our international uh, faculty today. He is at Singapore. He is a consultant at Raffles Hospital, Singapore. Uh, graduated from MC Delhi. And then uh, he completed his fellowship at uh, National University Hospital Minister. And he has been in the National University Hospital at Singapore till 2019. And he has a major uh, interest in nerve regeneration and neuroprosthetic interfaces. He will be talking on scaphoid unit injuries. Dr. Larry, sir, please. Thank you very much. Whether only I am unable to hear or everybody is unable to hear. Shankar, even I cannot hear. Okay. Uh, Amitabha, yeah. Dr. Lahari, you are muted. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, restart from the beginning. Okay. Okay. Doctor, please click on uh, slideshow. Yes, uh, this is actually, I have, uh, uh, are you able to hear? Yes, doctor.
Uh, doctor, please start. Again, we are unable to hear you. Okay, okay. Is it a recorded lecture, sir? Yeah, yeah. There's some I... problem with the audio transmission, I oh, think. Okay. Can you improve okay, the Okay, no volume? problem. Yeah. Okay, okay uh, never mind. Um, you remove, uh, just block the audio within the slide so, so that uh, your original voice will come. Okay. The first slide, first slide, you go back, escape, and you see that there is an audio file there uh, on the first slide itself. Okay, okay. just a second. Escape, escape, escape it. And also, he has to enable the sound of the computer. No, no. Uh, uh, doctor, enable... while sharing the slide, you have to enable uh, share sound. Then click on okay. the presentation. This. Mm. But then so he will not. I'm... Then you will not be able to speak then. Okay. Um, all right. Then I'll just uh, speak through the lecture. There is an audio file. You can see on the right side of the corner of that. The audio file you have to unmute. Mute it. Mute that. Mute that. Mute that. Yeah. Anyway. Sorry about this. Okay. I'll just uh, speak the on the, this thing. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, uh, the most important uh, thing... Oh, shit. Just you have to unmute uh, mute this uh, file. This audio file is embedded in the first slide. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, there will be two voices. One is inbuilt in the PowerPoint and will, you will be speaking okay. live. Okay. Uh, there, there is on corner there is an audio file. You see audio file on the right side yeah. of the corner yeah. of the first slide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You you uh, scale down that uh, volume button of that. Okay. There is. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. Now you can go. Now make it a full show. Yes. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Very well, sir. Okay, so scaffold unit injuries. So this is the work uh, done by Vegas in uh, uh, the doctor. Uh, don't worry. So doctor, stop sharing. Then okay. uh, again, uh, click on share screen. And in the share screen, in the bottom, can you see uh, share sound? Oh yes. Yeah. Just uh, just okay. put a tick mark there. Okay. Then click on the presentation. To the scaphal lunate ligament yes. okay. impacts wrist kinematics. And scaphal lunate dissociation was first described and coined by Lin Shai in 1972. Scaphal lunate injuries result from wrist hyperextension, ulnar deviation, and intercarpal supination. So Mayfield classified these injuries into four stages starting with the scapholuminate rupture, lunocapitate rupture, and the lunotriquitral rupture, ultimately resulting in complete dislocation of the lunate. And these are known as the lesser arc injury. The scaphoid is stabilized by numerous ligaments. So this includes the STT ligament, the scaphocapitate ligament, the RSC ligament, and the long radiolunate ligament. On the dorsal side, it includes the DIC ligament, specifically the scaphotriquitral ligament and the dorsal component of the scaphotriquitral ligament, which is the main stabilizer. Mark Garcia has demonstrated that under axial loading, the wrist undergoes a flexion pronation on the radial side, anteromedial translation and extension supination on the ulnar side. And this um, movement is counterbalanced by the so-called helical antipronation ligaments. And this includes the LRL or the long radiolunate ligament, volar LT ligament, the scaphotriquitral ligament, dorsal scaphotriquitral ligament, and the scaphocapitate ligaments. This uh, shows the evolution of scaphotriquitral injuries. In cases of partial tear, there is normal, ali normal alignment. Gradually, with stretching of the ligaments, the scaphoid goes into flexion and the lunate and the triquetrum go into extension, creating a DC deformity 
over time, this malalignment becomes irreducible and gradually progressing to osteoarthritis. This classification is extremely important to understand the pathology of scaphoid dissociation and to decide the appropriate management. So pre-dynamic state is basically in the case of uh, partial tears, there is no malalignment and the wrist is essentially stable. In a dynamic deformity, the scaphoid ligament is torn, but the secondary stabilizers are intact and the deformity appears only when the forces uh, are applied. So in this case, what you need is to address only the scaphoid ligament. In static reducible deformities, the scaphoid ligament as well as the secondary stabilizers are compromised. Now, this could be acutely torn or they can be chronically attenuated. So in these cases, you need to address the scaphoid ligament as well as uh, the secondary supports in order to maintain the position of the wrist. Now, in static irreducible uh, deformities, the, there is scarring and the normal alignment cannot be restored. So one needs to do limited fusions. Whereas in st static irreducible deformities with arthrosis, which is also known as slack wrist, major fusions are required. So one of the most important signs which indicates scaphoid unit incompetence is known as the Watson shift test. Now, in this case, the, uh, the wrist is brought in ulnar deviation where the scaphoid goes into extension. And this uh, scaphoid is held in extension by thumb pressure. And when the wrist is brought into radial deviation, the scaphoid dislocates and relocates, giving rise to a clunk. However, uh, this sign should not be attempted in acute injuries where a partial tear can be converted into a full tear. The radiological parameters to define DC deformity are measured on lateral view and one can create the central axis of the radius, lunate, scaphoid and capitate to measure these deformities. The other alternative is uh, basically to measure the axis of the radius, the axis of the lunate, but however, tangential axis of the scaphoid and the tangential axis of the capitate. The normal um, lateral scaphoid lunate angle is between 30 to 60 degrees, and above that is considered DC deformity. And for this to be measured accurately, one needs to do a true lateral X-ray. These are the important radiologic signs of uh, scaphoid lunate dissociation. So first of them is scaphoid lunate diastasis of recording of stopped. The a ring sign where the scaphoid is in flexion, the radial unit angle greater than 15 degrees, and the scaphoid unit angle more than 60 to 70 degrees. One of the most accurate ways to evaluate scaphoid unit injuries and to characterize the degree and the nature of Recording injury. Recording in progress. In 2001, the sensitivity was reported as 63% and specificity was recorded as 86%. Whereas with 3T MRIs now, it's extremely accurate in the range of 90 to 100%. Arthroscopy is basically the gold standard for diagnosis and one can clearly evaluate the scaphoid ligament as well as uh, the degree of dissociation and the nature of cartilage in various joints. This is basically the Geisler's classification. It is descriptive and it gives the idea about the nature of the scaphoid unit um, ligament, whether there is a separation and whether there is a step off or not. It also gives an idea about the degree of laxity present between the scaphoid and the lunate. These are the treatment principles in scaphoid lunate dissociation. So in a pre-dynamic situation, uh, one can do an arthroscopic debris of the tear or can do perform a thermal shrinkage. Cast immobilization generally has no role. In a dynamic situation where there is an acute tear of the uh, scaphoid lunar ligament, one can do a K-wire uh, stabilization or you can perform a direct 
repair, one may also consider capsular desics. In static reducible, one needs to reconstruct the primary scaphoid ligament and address the secondary stabilizers. So this can be done by using capsular desis and some form of tenodesis. In static irreducible, limited fusions are indicated. And in slack wrist, either um, proximal row carpectomy or fusions are indicated. Electrothermal uh, collagen shrinkage basically involves heating up of the SL ligament. It is effective only in partial injuries. So this denatures the type 1 collagen, resulting in a very stiff mass of collagen, which basically tightens up and strengthens the injured scaphoid ligament. Open repair of the scaphoid ligament can be considered in uh, acute injuries of the scaphoid ligament and uh, the exposure is through the dorsal capsule preserving the DIC and the DRC ligaments. Once scaphoid unit uh, area is exposed, it is reduced by KYS and the ligament is either directly repaired or repaired using anchor sutures. There is an idea about arthroscopic repair of the scaphoid unit ligament. However, this is only possible when both sides of the ligament are intact and, and they are repairable. This is an interesting technique. And uh, in this case, again, the repair is stabilized by inserting KYS between the scaphoid and the lunar. This is the capsular desis technique described by Berger. In this case, you can see the scaphoid lunate gap. This is a static reducible uh, deformity. And this is being reconstructed using a capsular flap. And this uses suture anchors as well as KYS. Denodesis techniques are used in reducible dissociations with irreparable ligaments. So the initial techniques were described using the ECRB to reinforce the scaphoid ligament and to stabilize the scaphoid in extension. Brunelli described the using the FCR and going from volar side to the dorsal side. This is a paper comparing the capsular desis and tenodesis techniques. In both the situations, what we see is that we are able to achieve almost 90% grip strength, but the range of motion is in the range of uh, 64 to 65%. Garcia Elias has proposed the use of ECRL instead of ECRB in order to uh, provide the scaphoid reconstruction and this is called the three ligament tenodesis, and a further modification of this technique called the ECRL spiral tenodesis, where there's a dorsal as well as volar reconstruction. Static irreducible uh, dissociations are dealt with limited fusions. Now, scaphoid unit diffusions have been uh, attempted, but they have a very small contact area and very high chances of failure. Better than scaphoid fusion are STT fusions and scaphocapitate fusions. So in summary, the pre-dynamic uh, dissociations are treated with uh, the debrimon or thermal shrinkage. Dynamic dissociations are treated with KVI stabilizations or direct repair, sometimes capsulodesis. Static reducible dissociations are treated with capsulodesis and tenodesis. Static irreducible uh, dissociations are treated with limited fusions and slack risk in, involves PRC or major uh, fusions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Thanks. Lehri, for an excellent presentation. So, uh, we'll be taking the question in the end. There are two devices on. So now moving on with the program, we have a very, very eminent speaker, a teacher for most of us, Dr. P.P. Kotwal. He needs no introduction. He has been professor and head of All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He is the chairman now of Orthopedics PSRI, New Delhi. 
and he has written probably more work than I have even read in orthopedics. He has three books to his credit, 38 chapters, 140 publications, and more than 600 guest lectures. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. President, IOA, the team, Mirkon, Dr. Gopal Goel, Vikas Gupta, and my friends. I will uh, share my screen. Just want to go back. So, well, so thanks for giving me an opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, MidCon and talk on a very commonly encountered uh, uh, problem in every orthopedic surgeon's uh, practice is the fracture of the distal end of radius, including ulnar stylite, open reduction, and internal fixation. The, as you all know, conservative treatment, of course, is the mainstay. Uh, still, close reduction and POP cast, and particularly useful in displaced, uh, stable, or, and uh, reducible fractures. And this is still the commonest treatment method in India. However, uh, you know, papers, papers started coming up, and then uh, this paper, orthogonal plating uh, for distal radius fractures, and it uh, concluded that the restoration of anatomy is required for the best functional outcome. Another paper says that the ORIF of in distal intraarticular radius fractures lead to predictable results concerning restoration of length and form of the distal radius. And that's where the role of uh, the role of open direction internal fixation came into practice and the main indications for ORIF, as you all know, are the displaced irreducible fractures, unstable fractures, comminuted intraarticular fractures and fractures in the osteoporotic bones in the elderly. And uh, then came the uh, LCP. You can see here this uh, reduces and fix the fracture very well, restoring the anatomy and then of course, uh, can get good results with a good post-operative therapy program. Then came the three-column theory. As you all know, there are the three columns, the radial, the intermediate, and the ulnar column. And uh, they are actually important in the load transmission attachment to the ligaments and uh, osseous structures and, and the secondary load transposition and so on. And there came the, um, the concept of uh, column fixation. And uh, this is an example uh, for a comminuted uh, fracture of the distal end of uh, radius. The uh, because there is combination both of the radial stylite as well as on the volar side. So this actually this is the concept for column fixation orthogonal plating where you would put a separate plate on the on the radial stylite and put a volar locking plate. And uh, this would be the result, and you can give two different uh, uh, incisions uh, uh, spaced a little too far from each other, and uh, to be able to fix both the plates. Of course, you can even do it with a minimal thing as well. This is one of the older pictures, but then you can get a, a good result. Then came the variable angle uh, LCP, which is in uh, common use these days, and uh, this actually has an advantage of uh, this uh, special uh, uh, the jig where you can angle your uh, the drill and the screw, screws in such a way that you can get about 15 degrees, degrees of placement in either direction without going or entering into the joint, even if you are putting the screws at the very subcondral level of the distal end of the radius. And this would be the, the fixation and the picture. And you, because of this, you can even go very close, short of the, uh, of the uh, white shed line, but still not enter the, enter the joint. Then came the concept of a four corner concept and in a paper by Peter Brink, where he described, this is actually a CT based assessment of the fracture of the distal radius where it is divided into radius is this wrist is divided into four corners and this is the the dorsal the volar radial and ulnar and this is how you would see that which corner which corner is uh, comminuted or is uh, majorly uh, fractured and here the key corner is the fragment with which the lunate goes 
is considered as the key corner. For example, this is the, uh, the CT scan where you can see her, there is, there is a dorsal combination and the lunate is going along with this fragment on the dorsal side. So this would be the, uh, the key corner. And the goal would be that this key corner displacement must and the, and the subluxation of the lunate must be corrected to avoid subluxation with alteration in the entire joint mechanics uh, kinematics later on. And this is an example. This is the key corner and this is going on to the dorsal side. This is the dorsal side. So therefore, the according to this uh, concept, the plating should be uh, on the dorsal side. And therefore, this would put into into place, reduce the subluxation of the of the of the lunette and fixation, better fixation of the of the fragments. On the other hand, if you try to fix this on the this side, this may not hold the proper proper uh, the fragment properly, and there can still remain some degree of subluxation of the fracture as well as the lunette. Another example of a of a fracture of the distal radius, and uh, there cannot be a, a better example of the use of CT scan or the importance of CT scan in some fractures of the distal radius. For example, here, and you can see here, you cannot really make out exactly the configuration of the fracture. And therefore, a CT scan would actually tell you this is on the volar side. So there is a, a shearing fracture of the volar cortex. And because of this displacement, the, you are not able to see a good uh, this thing evaluation on the plain X-ray. And this is uh, they are now here. The key. This is the key fragment where the lunate is gone along with it. And therefore, this needs to be fixed on the volar by the volar plate. So as you fix it with the volar plate, this would be reduced beautifully, and you would certainly get a very good result, uh, provided you start your therapy properly and continue it on at least for about six to eight weeks. I will dwell upon a little bit on the uh, concept of dorsal plating. The ideal candidate for a dorsal plating is the multi-fragmented dorsally displaced fracture of the distal radius with dorsal bony defects. As you can see here, there is the dorsally angulated and displaced fracture and with there is dorsal combination. However, even this fracture can also be fixed by a volar plate. These days we have the locking plates and if the fracture is big and uh, is little large enough, we can take one or two screws uh, good fixation, then obviously this can also be fixed, uh, fixed from the volar side. But otherwise, this is the classical ideal candidate for a dorsal plate. So the dorsal approach, you can go uh, over the Lister's tubercle on the dorsal side and open up the, the fourth um, compartment, extensor, fourth extensor compartment. And this is how you will do it. You will lift it superiorly. So you are now working deeper to the fourth extensor compartment. And after having reflected the, uh, the fourth uh, compartment, all the extensor tendons, now you have the uh, dorsal surface of the radius exposed completely where you can put your implant on the dorsal side. So this is an example of a, a dorsally angulated commutated fracture and where which can use the uh, dorsal plate. The dorsal plates are the special plates which are low profile and uh, can maybe therefore and very small low profile plates. So you can use one or two plates depending upon the fracture configuration. The dorsal plating is also used uh, where you want to fix uh, by column fixation. For example, this here, this uh, case here, there is definitely a fracture of the radial starlight and there is a, a die punch fragment and also uh, some degree of uh, dorsal combination. So here one can use the uh, the dorsal plate for fixation as well as the uh, radial stylite plate to fix the radial fragment. So this is also another indication for the dorsal plating. The dorsal plating is also uh, included in the in the technique where you are using the double plating. For example, if there are combination on the both both sides and uh, severe combination in that case, you can definitely go on to, on either side and fix it with the, so this is the uh, volar plate and this is the dorsal plate uh, and can get a very good uh, restoration of the anatomy of the distal radius in spite of the so much of combination and a good post-op result uh, after a good therapy program. Remember, 
the wherever you have to do a double plating either for the column fixation or anything the volar plating is actually the consensus plating and uh, therefore often it is the primary mode of fixation with augmentation from the radial styloid plate or the dorsal plate or both so in in such a situation it means that you must do the volar plating first and then see whether you need an augmentation from the radial side uh, styloid or from the um, on the on the posterior side and this is the example that if you do not fix the uh, volar plate first and maybe by mistake you have gone on to fix up on the other side this is what the lacunae may remain the there may be a loss of because the restoration of the the radial length does not happen and therefore this may lead to loss of the radial length the loss of the perfect curve or the contour of the distal reticular surface and there may be also a uh, negative ulnar variance uh, because of the uh, collapse or the improper fixation or maintenance of length of the of the radius the flip side of the dorsal plating is that you know it can cause stiffness and the often definitely the fear is that you know because you are going from the dorsal side and there can be uh, incidents of tendon rupture or tendon irritation tendinosis and so on and obviously if you are doing the dorsal uh, plating alone in that case it has there is actually a limitation that inability to address the issue of lunate fossa onto the volar side if there is a, a fracture there as well then obviously your alone dorsal plating will not be able to address that issue however even there are uh, problems that occur with even the volar plating as well as you we all know and uh, this is actually a case which i will uh, take up this is a an orthopedic surgeon working somewhere in the middle east and he sustained this fracture so they first tried doing uh, k wire uh, fixation which was accept uh, which was certainly not acceptable then they did a uh, uh, volar plating and which looks uh, quite good and uh, but then later on he he realized this thing this came up that you know there was the uh, this he was unable to extain the Uh, thumb and this was as you all know you can make out that this is due to the rupture uh, this occurs due to the rupture of the EPL tendon and this is what happened actually as the lateral view was taken you know he has those uh, screws which are longer protruding onto the dorsal side and this perhaps led to the rupture of the extensor pollicis longus tendon so this is when he came to us and we actually we changed the the screws and uh, I put the shorter screw so that now that that problem is not there but at the same time we had to do something for his thumb uh, uh, loss of thumb extension so we did the uh, the transfer of the uh, indices uh, proprius extensor indices proprius and brought it here and sutured it to the uh, stump of the epl tendon and so this is how he could restore the full extension uh, of the thumb then you have also have fractures which are actually the volar rim fractures and where the fracture line is too distal you know can see here a very distal fracture line and this would not take uh, perhaps uh, any screw at least in in the major part of the fragment maybe you can just have a screw here or maybe a small screw here but this does not give a very good uh, perhaps stability so in such situations or actually when you the ct scan shows that is really very thin uh, Uh, fragment of the of the distal fragment, and th therefore, what we actually try uh, we do this in these cases when we are not able to put a screw distally, then we would put a a wire a a circular wire, put it into the distal fragment. The distal fragment will certainly be able to take that wire and uh, bend it like this and bring it onto the volar surface of the distal radius, and then anchor it and fix it with a with a plate. and also of course using the moon graphs if required so this is how the x ray looks so this is actually into the distal uh, fragment and uh, this is fixed and the more or less the restoration of the anatomy has has taken place and uh, a good result can uh, certainly be obtained the ulnar stylet process uh, fractures are also often associated and the association can be about 50 to 75% along with the fractures of the distal radius 
and they can be fixed by any of these methods if you can use a small screw or maybe just a k wire or sometimes if there's a larger fragment you can even do a tension band wiring as well however according to this paper by the jesse jepiter uh, group uh, this is actually this is the effect of an unrepaired fracture of the ulnar stoloid base then what was the out outcome when the distal radius fracture was fixed with plate and screw and it says that the this type of unrepaired styloid process does not influence the outcome after treatment of a distal radius fractures with plate and screw fixation even when the ulnar fracture was initially displaced for about 2 mm or more than 2 mm so if there is even a displacement of the ulnar styloid process it not necessary to fix it always unless it is a very large fragment and and also if it is also disrupting the druj otherwise it may not be necessary to fix this uh, fracture now i will end up with this uh, with this case you know this was a case who had uh, uh, a fracture of the distal radius and the subluxation of the unit lunet which was treated elsewhere and it uh, mal united and with uh, prominence of the uh, ulnar styloid the druj subluxation as well so somebody fixed it with a uh, with a plate after correcting the length of the radius but the screws were in the uh, perhaps in the in the joint and therefore they were removed subsequently so although this looks uh, the radius and this thing looks all right but the there are still uh, subluxation of the druj and uh, he has the still the prominence of the ulnar stoloid and there is so much of restriction of the of the movements so the lesson learned from this thing and this will be the my concluding slide that treat every fresh fracture correctly avoid to avoid complications like mal union and non union it doesn't matter what method of treatment you adopt but the, this must be correct, treated properly Uh, because these complications may require surgical procedure or procedures and even that which may not still give full functional result thank you very much for your attention yeah thank you dr gotwal sir it's always a pleasure uh, listening to you and uh, always we keep learning from you so now this uh, whole session all the four lectures are open for discussion so anybody wants to comment or have a question please go ahead dr anil bhat sir uh nothing specific from my side sir in terms of the comments as such i mean always great to hear uh, kotwal sir and uh, amitab it was a great talk yeah thank you so much thank you thank you so uh, if i may ask dr bird sir uh, you said that if there is a doubt we should go for an mri so is there is a concept that if mri is done too early let's say within half an hour of the surgery or of the injury patient comes to us and we say ki x ray kiya hai dekh nahi raha hai fracture so let's go ahead and go for an mri so do you think there is a specific period uh, for which we should wait there is an interval between the injury and the mri or it's okay earlier the earlier the better uh basically what we are looking at is is there a fracture if the fracture is there it would have caused some amount of inflammatory reaction to start with so the same pathological process should be followed so there is for the inflammatory uh, factors to come in so for the edema to set in and you know some changes to be seen it might take between 24 to 48 hours so it would be i mean within half an hour of somebody falls and comes i don't think it's a, a good idea to do so that. my question was just to uh, yeah. uh, for the viewers yeah. what is the right yeah. time we should be ordering an mri so if we follow the same basic pathological processes i think the ideal would be to wait for a day and then see for the inflammatory process that is what we, we try to look at uh, especially the subtle fracture yeah occult fractures Uh, Dr. Amitab sir, Dr. Larry sir, sir yeah. for this uh, scaphoid unit injuries, yeah. Uh, till how many weeks after injury can we attempt an open repair? And what are the tissues we can use to repair those ligaments? Yeah, sir. I think uh, there is uh, there are a few things. So normally up to four to six weeks, uh, the scaphoid unit ligament can still be there and be uh, repaired. 
However, uh, this is not uh, very fixed. The, the other thing is that there is also a, what is the pattern of uh, the rupture of the scaphoid ligament. Sometimes it is a bulge on one side, and the other side is quite substantial. Whereas sometimes there is a large central tear, and both sides are very short. So it it has to be done on like a case by case basis. And the second thing is that um, if there is no substance. then we have to use any supplementary uh, tissues so for example now um, there is a new uh, uh, or relatively new uh, anchor system called swivel lock system it has a swivel lock as well as a tape it has a fabric tape and you can harvest a very thin palmaris longus or any other tendon and integrate it with the tape and do a, a repair and this tape reinforces the strength until the whole construct heals so that's a very good system and and i think it will change a little bit uh, what we do specifically in the spiral type repairs and all so you can address the scaphoid flexion even from the dorsal side so th- they have come up with some techniques like that the second idea is this bone tissue bone uh, uh, construct like if you take uh, uh, grafts from the tarsal bone or other carpal bones when you have a bone graft ligament bone construct and uh, put it on the scaphoid and the lunate and reconstruct uh, ligament but uh, i put didn't put the slides uh, for that discussion because the time was quite short but i feel this is very destructive i mean i am scared to even put two implants into the scaphoid in the proximal area and and it it can cause uh, damage to the vascularity so once we are making a full trough into the uh, scaphoid and lunate we are causing a lot of destruction and in asia the size of the bones is actually much smaller than if you go to like a uh, europe or uh, or america so i think the bone uh, uh, ligament bone constructs i really don't think we should be doing and the other thing is that sometimes we are doing volar dorsal that also we have to be very careful when we are doing a exposure on volar and dorsal side to reconstruct a tenodesis type uh, construct that there can be a very serious avascular necrosis involving the scaphoid and the lunate and i have seen one case uh, in uh, past many years where there's a massive necrosis in the on in the proximal row so these are the options basically uh Dr. Kotwal, sir, yeah. uh, when should we be even thinking of fixing an ulnar stellae? Most of the time, it is so small. Uh, but what are the indication when we should definitely go ahead and fix it, and how to fix it? Uh, as I said, you know, if there is a fracture with uh, which is actually from the base of the ulnar stellae, and if it is uh, uh, displaced more than two or millimeters or so, that's number one. and also if there is an associated druj um, instability uh, then of course you need to fix that and that can be decided that once you have fixed the distal radius then on the table itself you try to see instability um, and if it is uh, generally the instability is not so that mu- not that much then maybe you can uh, leave that or else you can uh, decide to fix that and depending upon the uh, the size of the fragment and whatever is available with you or the expertise about it you can just fix it with a with a k wire also or if there is a um, small screw available you can fix it with a with a screw also because always tension band is not so commonly done but you can fix it with a wire or with a with a small screw Usually, what is the plane in which the wire goes if ulnar stellate has to be fixed? Usually, it is from the dorsal side or the volar side. Oh, you can actually, with, if you are just passing a K wire, then it can be percutaneous also. With from the tip, you can directly go into the into the uh, ulna. It can be a um, as I said, percutaneous also. Right. in case we have fixed the radius, but still the ulna is moving dorsal uh, volarly. Yeah. so is there any role of fixing a wire from the ulna to the radius yeah that also sometimes is done if it is gross instability and that instability is reduces with the forearm in supination 
and therefore you have to you need to pass a uh, trans fixation k wire between uh, ulna and radius and keep that on for about 4 weeks or so right thank you sir thank you. so any other faculty will like to comment or add to all this most welcome i think it has been a very great session thank you thank you so if there are no more questions uh, may i request dr vinit dabas to take over from here for the next session thank you thank you thank you dr hamish so i think uh, uh, am i audible Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think it was a very uh, good topic on very uh, basic but important topic. So, uh, moving from there, I think the the next session is can be considered as more advanced, uh, full of more advanced topics. But again, these are topics which are important because these are the injuries which we can consider as missed injuries. They should not be. more and more uh, information coming to us and we are able to pick up these injuries in time not wasting any more time i would request the first speaker dr voilin uh, to please start uh, to share her uh, slides just a brief introduction she is a upper limb uh, surgeon from laureate of raris uh, medical university and she specializes in micro surgery and arthroscopy uh Are you there, Doctor Voilin? Yes. Doctor Voilin, can you please unmute yourself and share your slides? Doctor Wailin, are you there? Hello. Yes, I'm here with you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I will share my. Uh... Thank you very much. Uh, I will share my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, Doctor Wayne, any the, help or need? Ah, uh, excuse me. Yes. Um, écran partagé. Voilà. Can you see my uh, computer? Yes, yes we can. can. <laughs> okay. Alors, ça c'est pas ça du tout. Ah, uh, I come in one second. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, doctor, you can open your PPT presentation. Uh, is it possible? Uh, I, I need only one minute because I have a problem with my computer. Uh, is it possible somebody to start and and I do the next one? Hello, Hello. Hello. Yeah, Doctor. Yeah. I need the 
one small second, I'm sorry. So maybe you can do one. We need, can we go to next speaker and yeah. by the time she's ready, we can have. Uh, Dr. Pankaj, uh, are you there? Stop. Uh, yes, I am there. Violin, you'll have to stop sharing your screen so that uh, we can go on to the next speaker. Yeah. So, Dr. Pankaj, uh, I think Dr. Pankaj Jindal does not need a lot of introduction. His uh, He's from Pune and his instruction course lecture is one of the most coveted uh, courses on hand surgery. So, he's speaking on transcaphoid perinate injuries. Again, a very important topic. If we can pick up these injuries and manage them. It is quite uh, useful for the, it is quite helpful for the patients. So please, uh, you can start your talk. Thank you, Vinay. Uh, uh, am I visible? Uh, is my yes, slide visible? Are. Yes, okay. you are, sir. I thank the Delhi Orthopedic Association for this uh, opportunity. I'm going to talk to you about a perilunate dislocation. There's another nomenclature of a carpal instability where the bones within a single row are involved. It's carpal row instability, CID. When entire carpal row is affected, it is carpal instability, non-dissociation. I'll not go into the details because the time allotted is only 10 minutes here. There are about five types of carpal dislocations. The one that is most common is perilunate and we'll focus on this only. And we'll talk about what defines a perilunate dislocation what happens in this situation, what are the signs and symptoms, how to pick it up on the x-ray, how do you manage an acute situation, late situation, and what if you are in a big problem. Uh, perilunate injuries affect the soft tissue and the bones around the lunate, and it rarely affects the lunate itself. So it is the problem of the soft tissue and the bones around the lunate here. In a normal situation, the radius, the lunate and the capitate are coaxial, but in a perilunate dislocation, the capitate gets out of the socket. In almost 97% of the situation, the capitate is dislocated dorsally. In about 2 to 3% situation, the capitate is volarly dislocated here. It's a high energy trauma, and because it's a high energy trauma, other systems are also involved, other bones are also involved to the tune of almost 61% here. It's usually, it's most often a motorcycle accident at a high speed, fall from a height, or high energy contact sport here. So as you'll see, in all these situations, the risk goes into a situation of hyperextension. But remember, all these injuries are a violent fall. And because of a violent fall, multiple other structures are also likely to be affected here. In all these situations, the risk goes into hyperextension. And this is extremely important because that comes into play when you are talking about the management here. In all these hyperextension injuries, while the soft tissue and the ligaments are breaking and snapping other than the bones around the carpal bones, the lunate may dislocate on the volar aspect here. And what happens as the risk goes into hyperextension, the metacarpals and the capitate goes into extension. The lunate remains in place to start with because of the short and the long radio lunate ligaments here. But as the disease, as the injury progresses, the lunate may fall out and may come to lie on the volar aspect, affecting the median nerve here. As was mentioned by Dr. Sandeep Shaina earlier, Mayfield has given a beautiful uh, description of the injury and has shown that there's a predictable progression of the injury and there's a ligament failure which is again extremely predictable. The injury starts on the radial side. To start with, the ligament between the scaphoid and the lunate snaps. As the disease progresses, from the scaphoid lunate and ligament, it progresses to the ligament between the capitate and the lunate. And further, it falls to start and involve the ligament between the trichotrum and the ligament and the lunate. So starting from the scaphoid lunate to the lunate, uh, between the lunate and the capitate, then the next <laughs> ligament to fall is the ligament between the lunate and the trichotrum. <laughs> 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 Violin, can you unmute yourself? Can you <laughs> mute yourself, Violin? <laughs> 
And as the disease progresses, the unit can dislocate totally here. So the injury can involve purely the ligaments or it can involve the bone as well here. When it involves purely the ligaments, it's called lesser arc injury. When it involves the bones, it in, it's called a greater arc injury. When the bones are involved, it may involve more bones, just not the scaphoid. It may involve the radial stylar process, the scaphoid, the capitate, and other ulnar bones of the cap carpal bones as well. As in any violent injury, the part affected is the wrist. It would be swollen. It will be deformed. The movements will be painful with grossly restricted range of motion. Since it's a high velocity injury, always look for other more serious injuries here. Always watch out for median of involvement, vascular injuries and open wounds. And being a violent injury, the airways, breathing and circulation has to be assessed as well here. Often you can pick it up on the plane x-ray and what you require is a P and lateral view. Sometimes you will require a scaphoid view because the scaphoid is hidden inside multiple bones here. Gilula's lines were discussed earlier here. Do you require CT and MRI? You don't really require CT and MRI unless you are looking for other carpal injuries which are not seen on plane x-rays here. Gilula's lines were discussed. So I'll not go into the details here. And what happens the gillula's lines are not smoothly seen and they are disrupted in uh, peril unit injuries here. The other thing you'll see what is crowd, called as a crowded carpal sign. You'll see how uniformly the bones of the carpal bones are in the lines and in, in the rows and files. But this is missed and this is lost and the bones are overlapping on each other and there looks like a crowd here. And this is a crowded carpal sign of a peril unit injury here. The next thing that you'll see, you'll see overlapping of the lunate on the adjacent scaphoid and the triquitrum here. Again, an indicator of a perilunate injury here. In a normal course, you'll see a whole length of the scaphoid, but here you see a more dense shadow of the scaphoid pole and the scaphoid. This is called at the ring sign here. And the next thing you'll see, the lunate looks triangular. And this is abnormal because of the angulation of the lunate that happens in the perilunate injuries. The next thing you'll also see when the lunate is dislocated is a spilled cup sign here. The lunate is lying anteriorly, pointing anteriorly here. This is a lunate dislocation, also called as a spilled cup sign here. You can call it a piece of cake or a piece of pie. Again, as was discussed, that lunate looks triangular because of the angulation that's had, that has occurred in the lunate here. The management is simple. If the ligaments are broken, they have to be repaired. If the bones are broken, they have to be reduced and they have to be fixed here. But in the primary setup, what is important is to identify if the median nerve is compressed, that has to be decompressed. And whatever gross dislocation that has occurred, that has to be set right. So close reduction is important if open reduction is going to be delayed significantly here. However, close reduction has very limited role and because in large number of cases, the bones are going to get displaced again. And therefore, this is not a definitive management in large number of patients. And most of them would end up on an operating table here. And how do you do a close reduction? The part have to be relaxed. You can't give a local anesthesia and reduce it. The patient has to be under general anesthesia or regional anesthesia or a block. And you give a 10 to 15 to 20 minutes of sustained traction. And... Once you have given this traction, you take a traction view here and again see how the bones look like. The crowded view of the bones would look more sober. Then you recreate the mechanism of injury. As I said earlier, it's a hyperextension injury. And therefore, you hyperextend the wrist here and then push the lunate, if it is not totally rotated, back into alignment. And as you gradually flex the wrist back, the lunate is likely to fall back and snap back into location onto the lunate fossa here. A majority of papers point at open surgery and say the outcome is better here. The goal of treatment is to approximate the bony anatomy for a length of time so that the ligaments can establish themselves into a normal anatomy and they heal nicely, which would mean almost 8 to 10 weeks of immobilization here. What is the approach? Majority of times, you need a dorsal approach between the third and fourth compartment. But sometimes, especially when the median nerve is involved, you need to go volar. Don't fight with the tissue. If you have to do more dissection, 
it's worthwhile going both from the dorsal and the volar aspect here. Dorsally, of course, is better. Most of the time, you'll do a dorsal surgery. You can see a better view of the scaphoid and you can do a better fixation of the scaphoid. But if the median nerve is involved, do volar side. Sometimes you have to do a combined volar and dorsal. The first uh, structure as you'll see when you go from the dorsal aspect will be the capitated head of the capitated because this is uh, seen in almost 95 to 97 percent of the situation because the capitated is displaced and uh, dislocated dorsally here. And the very important thing is what you do is after derotation, you put wires from the scaphoid to the lunate, from the scaphoid to the capitated, from the tricuterm into the lunate, and from tricuterm into the capitate after doing the reduction here. While you are doing this surgery, being an open surgery, if the ligament cannot be repaired, you put in screws, you put in anchors to have a good stability there. So this is what you need to, and you will end up after doing your fixation internally here. While you are doing on the anterior aspect, you will see the median nerve is likely to be tented under the dislocated, cap under the dislocated uh, lunate bone here. So very gently retract your median nerve and you'll see the uh, dislocated lunate bone. Through the space of prior you will be able to relocate your lunate back into alignment and you can then continue with your dorsal surgery and repair the ligaments and fixation here. How long you fix it? You fix it with KYS for almost six, uh, so I'm sorry, uh, how, what is the timing of surgery? Do it early. But the surgery has been done successfully as late as six weeks to six months later as well here. Can you be treated conservatively? The results have been found to be poor and only 25% of the situations, the reduction remained maintained. Otherwise, almost 75% of the situations, the result is likely, the reduction is likely to uh, be lost. The close reduction, you, the key is reduction has to be very accurate. Open reduction internal fixation will greatly enhance the possibility of maintaining the reduction here. But if the patient is unwilling for surgery, you, did, you cannot undergo, the patient of course cannot undergo surgery. Do a close reduction and hope for the best here. But while you are doing a close reduction and giving a trial, you do a serial x-rays. And if over a period of time you see the scaphoid unit uh, space is increasing by more than two to three millimeters, the angles are changing. You should counsel the patient and ask for undergoing an open surgery in these patients here. So this was one patient who had a, a, a dislocation. As you can see, the unit has dislocated here. He has a trans scaphoid. He has a pedal unit dislocation here. He underwent a surgery. He did an open reduction here and fixed it with multiple K wires here. And this is how we started and this after the follow-up. You'll see over a period of time, there will be gradual loss of reduction here. And this can possibly increase over a period of time here. This was another patient with a trans perial unit dislocation. Here the uh, scaphoid was a comminuted fracture here. We fixed it. Important thing we have found that sometimes you are trying to fix it and it becomes more and more difficult. Temporarily stabilize the floating lunate with the K-wire skiers from the skier radius to the lunate and do rest of your fixation. If the scaphoid is commuted, then it's worthwhile putting a bone graft primarily here because the possibility of getting a non-unit is extremely high, especially in a commuted fracture here. This was yet another patient who had a fractured... Uh, this was the same... I'm sorry. This is a long-term follow-up of the same patient here. And this is the kind of function we got of this patient here. What is late? It is difficult to say what is late, but up to 35 weeks, patients have reported a successful uh, uh, reconstruction of these patients here. But if the reduction is not possible, Dr. Professor Kotwal has presented a paper and there's a publication. Uh, you can do an external fixator to stretch out the contracted ligaments here. So this was one of these patients who had a contracted ligaments and you will see the lunate has dislocated anteriorly here. You put an external fixator and as you will see, they, the ligaments get stretched and they fall into alignment and then now you can do an internal fixation of these ligaments and they do reasonably well here. This is the longer term follow-up of the same patient here. What if the patient have presented late? They are likely to get arthritic changes here. If the lunate has pressing on the median nerve, it would uh, present as a carpal tunnel syndrome. And 
it can even cause rupture of the flexor tendons here in such situations it is worthwhile doing a proximal row carpectomy because it gives a predictably reasonable range of motion like this patient the capitate is now uh, in alignment with the radius here so this was one of these patient who had a non union of the proximal pole and you will see that uh, lunate is become triangular in shape here and this is pressing on the median nerve here from the proximal side we did a proximal row carpectomy and the patient had a reasonably good range of motion what are the long term results of this surgery yes of the perilunar dislocation happens and if you reduce it they will get arthritic changes but the prop, the good thing is they are well tolerated and the changes that you see are only on the x rays the pain patient's wrist becomes reasonably pain free here there was another publication we said they get not likely to regain the normal wrist motion but should have a functional which is reasonably pain free here and another interesting thing which came they compared the open reduction internal fixation versus a proximal row carpectomy the paper published as late as 2016 has said you can do a primary proximal row carpectomy and in mid term it gives as good results as open reduction so proximal row carpectomy has been considered as a primary line of treatment because the results have shown that over a period of time they do get arthritic changes which may of course remain painless here it is worthwhile knowing how not to do it once you see a fracture of the stylet process do not think beyond do not miss anything just see where the lunate is lying this was missed and therefore just do not fix it pay respect to other bones which are lying dislocated otherwise you can miss a peri transcaphoid perilunate dislocation so in summary see gilurda's line see alignment of the radius lunate and capitate in the metacarpal if that is lost probably you are looking at a perilunate dislocation if you see this thing respectfully see the median nerve and decompress it open method is preferred conservative patient is likely to lose the reduction in almost 75% of the situation and therefore it can lead to instability here always consider open reduction internal fixation you have options of kys anchors and screws if the patient is presented late you do either an external fixator or consider proximal row carpectomy i thank you very much for patient listening thank you uh, delhi orthopedic association thank you sir for the excellent talk It's always uh, always very uh, good to listen to you so uh, we'll take the questions at the end and if dr voilen is ready with her presentation can we go on to your talk ma'am Uh, can you see me now? It's okay yes, for you, are, you. Yeah, you are visible. Put your slides. Uh, please share your slides and let's see if that is visible. Can you see my? Now it's okay for you. No, we cannot see your slides yet. Ah, écran partagé. Yeah, your screen is visible now. Yeah, it's, it's thank, visible. Thank you very much. Yet. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, dear colleague, I'm very grateful you invite me to speak about my preferred intervention to treat scaphoid malunion. I will present you recent results of my prospective series since January 2016. Uh, we know that a scaphoid fracture can progress in five to fifteen percent in non-union. Even if gold standard is iliac crest cortico cancellus graft, our wish is to take graft on the same surgical area during one day surgery under local anesthesia that seems to be more comfortable for the patient. The main goal of this study is to evaluate results of this new technique on bone healing. To be sure, it's at least as good as open iliac graft with about 90% of scaphoid union. I will present you um, the study um, of my patient from 2016 to 2021 on 54 patients. They were reviewed by one independent observer. So, at the beginning, I uh, wanted to start, so I included only linear 
scaffold non-union and stable. And at the initiation of a French Society of Arthroscopic, I was asked to, to participate to the prospective surgery that we do now from 2019 uh, during five years. And I included progressively uh, unstable non-unions with a small recent disease and even cases of uh, uh, stiloscaphoidian arthritis. So inclusion criteria were non-union. Uh, officially, it's six months, but sometimes, like your colleague said this morning, uh, three months is already the time to do, do intervention. And if you are on arthroscopy, you can do the graft uh, immediately. Uh, whatever is the level of non-union is accessible for the arthroscopic technique when you are a little bit used to that. Uh, and I started uh, two ca in uh, three cases uh, to operate by arthroscopy, people uh, operated before by open uh, surgery. So exclusion criteria were uh, young uh, people aged under 15, uh, advanced arthritis on the wrist, and proximal pool necrosis. When I see a patient in consultation, I have the x-ray and I ask a CT scan so I can see the bone and uh, I can evaluate uh, arthritis. So the surgical technique, so I uh, start, uh, because of organization, I prefer to start with the graft sample. So uh, I take a small uh, incision on the tubercle of Lister, and I, with a trocar of hematology, I take uh, 7 to 15 carats. It depends on the bone loss in the, in the non-union. Uh, afterwards, uh, I, I start with a pill, so under scopic control, like a very good explained this morning, I, 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 I do the axis and I put the pin and I, if I want to put a screw in stable non-union, I prepare the drilling and then I, I come back with the pin a little bit to let uh, the non-union uh, free. So here you can see uh, one short video about uh, uh, cleaning. So first is debridement uh, with the shaver. We clean uh, the non-union. Here and here you have the scaphoid part. So I use a small curette, shaver, and rotative burn. Uh, and I, I like to do a wrist arthroscopy with water. Some people don't put the water. And then I, I stop the water and I put the graft when it's very, very clean. I do it by ulnar and radial mid carpal. So for putting the graft inside of the non-union, uh, I can use the trocar of hematology, but if you don't have it in the operative view, uh, you can also take the bone with a curette, do the prelevement with a curette, and then uh, take small uh, aspirate suction cannula, you know, uh, even for uh, hip prosthesis, very simple suction cannula, you put the graft inside, and you push with uh, the free part of the shaver, if uh, another uh, possibility. And then uh, with the hammer, I put the graft in compression. Afterward, uh, I put the hand out of the Whipple tower and I do the fixation when the wrist is on extension and ulnar inclination. So for final bone fixation, at the beginning, I put many, many screws. And when I do difficult case, uh, I use pin because uh, it's interesting. Uh, in the case of proximal non-union, so I can fix 
at the same uh, time the linate to protect the scaphoid and obtain his healing. In case of dizzy, like Delgado explained it, uh, I use a radiocarpal, a radiolunate pin uh, to reduce uh, the scaphoid non-union. So uh, pins are very interesting in difficult case of unstable non-union or proximal pole uh, fractures, non-union. So we evaluated bone union on X-ray and CT scan at three months because uh, it's uh, known that uh, uh, bone healing on scaphoid is uh, sure when you have the CT scan. And we study uh, many clinical and functional criteria. So uh, the actual series, last review, uh, beginning of the month, is uh, most of all men. Uh, we try to have non-smoker or smoker had to stop before intervention. And uh, usually it's uh, a medium uh, 20 months after the fracture that we operate. The most uh, localization were in the waist of the scaphoid and uh, it's uh, almost half pins and half screws. And sometimes I use both uh, screw and pin. So uh, people after surgery uh, at last follow up were less painful, had a better function of the hand, a better strength. And uh, for a change, we have 91% of bone union. So uh, it was our goal. For example, here you have a big uh, zone four or five non union uh, without arthritis. And uh, you have the graft and the final healing after one year. So, arthroscopy is an interesting way. Uh, it was not the first, I was not the first one, of course. Uh, but uh, I like arthroscopy and I wanted uh, to preserve absolutely um, dorsal capsule vascularization during the bone graft of scaphoid. Uh, I decided progressively to take radial cancellous bone because uh, many, many studies say radial bone and iliac bone is the same, but I'm not sure it's exactly the same. But in my small experience, uh, uh, we had good healing with radial bone, and we never had problem to get the enough bone on the radial side. Uh, pin and screw, uh, pin can migrate, uh, and we need to remove them, but when it's finished, there is no more anything in the wrist, so people like pin also. And if you do a screw, the screw has to be perfect. So uh, when uh, the, the time uh, after trauma, uh, I say three to six months, uh, during a surgery, usually I need uh, 44 to two hours, and uh, people have to be uh, immobilized for three months, uh, in, usually. So uh, we isolated some factor of non-union, five more uh, cases of non-union in smoker people, proximal zone, and when is a second surgery. So um, best indication are stable non-union for starting your experience, in the waist of the scaphoid, not, uh, if possible, with uh, dizzy uh, recent and uh, non-smoking patient. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, the next speaker that we have is Dr. Sudhi Warrior again, uh, not one who needs any introduction. Uh, Dr. Sudhi Warrior, are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Warling, can you stop sharing your uh, screen, please? So, Dr. Sudhi Warrior will be talking to us about DRUJ injuries and management. Again, one of the topics which is 
difficult to pick up uh, if you are not looking for it specifically. And I'm sure uh, he'll enlighten us on this uh, very important injury. So please, if you can start. Yeah, is my uh, screen visible? Yes, yeah. it is visible. You are audible okay. also. Right, thank you. Uh, we are all aware of the ulna column and the importance of the ulna column. So we won't dwell on that. We must, when we are talking about the DRUJ, throw our minds back to Tol Amit Tolat's paper, which tells us that the bony constraints are not strong enough and not stable enough. And therefore, the distal radio ulna joint depends upon the soft tissues. It's been my habit to use this uh, with uh, uh, while talking about this, uh, and I do apologize for that, but during the lockdown, I have found a much better alternative for all of us, very, very easily identifiable alternative, I must say, to understand what the main ligaments of the distal radio ulna joint are doing. The distal radio ulna joint is uh, supported by the dorsal and the volar radio ulna ligaments, which are attached to the fovea of the uh, ulna, and that's, this cradles the uh, TFC, and uh, that forms the strong uh, two ligaments that hold this joint together in an unstable uh, bony uh, 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 system. But it is important to remember that the radius is the monkey, that the madari is the ulna, so when we always talk about this dislocation, we refer mainly to the ulna as though it was the problem. But it's the radius that's jumping out because of the leeway that's given to it by the soft tissues as seen here. So we must understand that in our minds. Clinically, when you examine the patient, you must also remember the fact that there is a normal palmar sag. So if you push up, if you look at your own wrist, and this is my wrist, if you look, uh, it looks as though my ulna is jutting out, but the moment I push up my PC form, I'm able to reduce it. So this differentiates it from a deranged DRUJ. You must remember that there is a nine millimeter, eight to nine millimeter translation, which is normal, which is painless. And therefore the end point, if it's painful, if it's lax and if it's boggy, then you think it's a problem. Like in this case, you can't reduce it. And the piano key sign is pretty obvious there. So when it is a minor injury, then uh, it would probably be a strain or a partial tear, which can be conserved with rest in a good splint. I usually prefer an ulnar gutter splint because it then protects the wrist on the ulnar aspect while it prevents movements and allows healing if it's at all possible in such instances. But what if the patient comes to you with symptoms at two months following an injury and the ulna seems to be unstable? Well, then you need to think in terms of the clinical examination and see whether it is extremely unstable and painful. An MRI will obviously lead you to the diagnosis. And I do an open fixation uh, uh, of the TFCC where you go in from the ulna side and take care of the subsheath of the ECU, place an anchor and tie it down and fix the radio ulna joint, give an above elbow plaster for the period that it takes to heal, after which the wire is removed and you can do the rehab. If there is an ulna styloid fragment, which is completely lifted off and there are symptoms, an MRI will tell you why those symptoms are there because it is an incompetent uh, uh, joint. And even if it's a non-union, you need to then uh, try and pull it down back into its place. And again, I did this by an open technique. There's this wonderful, brilliant paper from Ravi Gupta from Ludhiana, from Chandigarh, where he uses a flap of the extensor retinaculum, which he then fixes to the distal radius and then double breasts it on itself. And he's done over a hundred cases with absolutely brilliant results. But if there is a bidirectional or severe unidirectional instability, then you must reconstruct it using the Brian Adams method, as I did in this patient, who, if you see on the right side, just cannot pronate at all. And the reason is the ulna is sitting on the volar side. There is zero pronation in this case. 
So there are various ways in which you can reconstruct this. I prefer this method. It's a little difficult. What you need to do is to drill across from the radial, uh, from the dorsal side to the volar side, keeping the median nerve in full view and preventing it from getting involved. Then thread through a slip of the palmaris longus. So you have the palmaris longus like that, and then recreate the DRU and the PRU. You can see the tunnel in the appropriate place. You fix the radio ulna joint uh, with a wire away from the uh, uh, sigmoid notch. And this is at 18 months, and you can see that she's got complete restoration of all the movements that she didn't have before the surgery with no compromise on the wrist movements also. But we mustn't forget the fact that the introscious membrane has not been addressed because at times if you section the, the, the PRU and the DRU, there still may not be any instability. And that is because the introscious membrane, if it does have the dorsal oblique band, is one of the most important stabilizers. And that's, a way, that's possible to see in about 40% of the cadavers. So therefore, instability would result if there was no distal oblique bundle or if there was an injury that involved the insertion of the distal oblique bundle. So we must keep that in mind, and it's not only what we can see on an MRI. There's a lot of work going on trying to find out whether we can image this and whether we can set this right with different procedures. We haven't started doing either of those in my practice at least. What about salvage? Salvage is required when there's instability or arthritis or a combination of both. How can you salvage the DRUJ? Well, you can get rid of the joint or you can replace the joint. How do you get rid of the joint? Well, you can excise the joint or you can fuse the joint. And how do you replace the joint? You could either do a partial replacement or a total replacement. So let's see some of these. This operation is over 105 years or 106 years old, and it still is one of the most controversial topics. And I still love this in specific, special instances, and I do it by the Dingman uh, modification. And in patients like this, which was fixed like that and ended up like this, he was a young patient, and I decided to do the Dingman modification. This is another patient of a rheumatoid arthritis, and therefore the uh, the incision is much larger for other purposes. But I use half the ECU to stabilize the stump and I leave the periosteum intact. And it's uh, well known that if you leave the periosteum intact and if there is some new bone formation in that, they tend to be far more stable than otherwise and do not have problems with the stump. Results are fairly good. Uh, what about fusion? When you have arthritis and when you have crepitus and when you have severe pain in that joint, you must fuse that joint. So you do a sorikapanji operation and you need to do a dissection of the ulna to give you back the pronation supination. I would add half ECU stabilization at that point and expect a result like this in almost all the patients. Again, results are fairly good, but there is a definite reduction in grip strength. So you must discuss this with the patient. What about joint replacements? We, I haven't done any, and I haven't seen great results with the ones that I have been able to review, either here or abroad. But uh, this seems to be the answer, the Louis Shecker prosthesis, which replaces the entire joint. Uh, these are borrowed from the website of Aptis Medical, and the results seem to be showing us, as time goes by, better and better survival rates of almost 96% and Kachui showed almost 100% in his 13 cases. So that seems to be the answer to a very bad, inst painful instability of the ulna, especially after you tried all the methods and failed at them. So how will you finally summarize the RUJ injuries? Well, if there is a mild instability, I would tend to conserve it. If there is a significant instability, and if it's early, I would try to put it back and repair it. And I'm sure uh, uh, Vikas is going to talk about the arthroscopic repairs. I do the open repairs. And if they do come late, we try and either excise the joint or fuse the joint or replace it. Well, that's all I have. But before I leave, I must say something. And that is the fact that uh, 
the conference is called bitcon in malayalam midcon means a very smart person well i hope the deliberations of this morning uh, will make each one of us a little more midcon than we already are thank you very much for this opportunity delhi orthopedic association thank you sir for the very concise uh, description of this injury and uh, moving forwards i would like to invite dr vikas gupta again one person who does not need any introduction we've all heard him before on various difficult topics and like any other joint arthroscopy and wrist is uh, is a thing which everybody is interested in knowing and it will be very interesting to hear dr vikas gupta who has been doing it for years now so over to you sir Sir, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yeah, you are audible, sir. Yeah. Just like the audible. Thank DOA, Dr. Gopal Goel, for giving this opportunity. Uh, my job is really made easy by previous speakers by, by talking about anatomy, biomechanics, treatment. So I'll straight away go to the arthroscopy part. As we know, wrist is a joint. which is like a very minimal space and through that we have to work on so it's more like a two dimensional joint rather than a three dimensional joint so to create a space traction is necessary so once we usually get five to 15 pounds of traction depending on the case i'll just for the uh, people who are new to the arthroscopy we talk about portals according to the extensor compartment so if you are going through between first and second compartment we say 1 2 and if you are going uh, through the third and fourth compartment we say 3 for portal 4 uh, and 5 uh, between fourth and fifth compartment but our main work horse is 3 4 and 6 are sometimes 6 u so arthroscopy helps us in viewing the joint from each angle so there are specifically portals for specifically procedures but my talk is limited to 10 minutes and we'll be talking about uh, trauma only so these are the indications for the arthroscopy uh, which include non traumatic disorders also but today's focus would be on tscc and other ligamentous repairs and arthroscopic assisted reduction fixation uh, i had a liberty to skip scaphoid fixation because dr Valen and Doctor Bhat, they they really covered it so nicely. I don't have to say much about it. So wrist has ten bones, twenty one ligaments. So arthroscopy, first thing we do, we just go through it, look at the ligaments, look at the uh, integrity of ligaments. So first indication, I'll directly go to the TFCC tear. TFCC has already been um, uh, anatomy has been discussed by Doctor Warrior. so we can divide by pharma classification into type 1 and type 2 type 1 are traumatic so we'll be limiting our discussion to type 1 uh, clinically press test it's a very good test uh, uh, like you ask the uh, person to press arm chair to lift uh, rotate his body weight on the wrist and if there is a pain it is one of the most sensitive test clinical test for the tscc other thing is tfc load load test in which you do the ulnar deviation of the wrist and you pronate and supinate if on pronation supination there is a pain then uh, the higher chances your tfcc is injured other thing is piano key sign as you can see dr warrior also showed there is a instability but if instability is less then you must always compare to the other side otherwise there can be over diagnosis and people with the lax joints so i'll just uh, again go to the uh, anatomy schematic part only so this is our tscc which is attaching on fovea and it one limb superficial limb attaches on the capsule this is on the capsule so this type of an injury where there is uh, attachment is preserved on the fovea such cases usually do not complain of uh, instability they just complains of pain and cases like this where fovea is detached can present with the instability because 
because of the detachment from fovea though other ligaments like volar and ulnar ligament and dov are also important in drg stability but we'll not discuss here so trampolin test is a test with which we with the probe we probe the thcc if it is bounces back like a trampolin that means it is intact uh, one thing we must always discuss that the scalarity of tlcc like in meniscus in the knee it's only in the peripheral part so any tear happening in the periphery are amenable to repair central tears because of devoid of vascularity if it, even if you try to repair them they are not going to heal so we usually peripheral tears are the only tears we try to repair type 1 lesion type 1b is a most common lesion so this is a video little bit longer video uh, if you want you can see it on our website also uh, there's a tlcc tear by tear there you can see that there is a synovitis at the end uh, this was not associated with instability so first thing we do is divide the um, edges then we this is a old video we used to use a, a suture lasso nowadays we are just using needles hypodermic needles so th this suture lasso was used once you have gone through the capsule through the tlcc there is a lasso which comes from the capsule over the needle and you try to catch the suture over the snare once it is in the snare you take your suture out and you tie a knot outside the capsule so this is how you catch the thread with the help of a snare but now techniques have become really simple using needle and the grasper and we take a lasso out uh, by using a either suture loop or uh, other kinds of types of suture passes so this is how we repair another case i won't go through it because this was the complex tear so this is before uh tying a suture knot we have taken multiple sutures and after the tying knots the gap is closed so it is amenable to healing what about foveal repair foveal repairs are done when uh, there is a instability so so in foveal repair you do the arthroscopy but you drill use a guide this is a guide by the arthrex which goes inside the tip is inside this is a guide which comes on from outside on the bone and two parallel kyas are passed once we are able to pass this is the outside view two parallel kyas and then we pass suture through the one hole and lasso through the other and retrieve the suture like this so suture is outside and in the end we form a configuration like uh, with a fiber wire uh, like a, a modified mason allen it gives a very good secure uh, fixation instead of uh, using anchor outside uh, to reduce the cost we can make a tunnel in the bone and tie it over tunnel so that reduces the cost of the anchor so in schematic diagram we can see that this is a tlcc tear we uh, take a suture uh, through the bone through the ulna by using two tunnels then we take suture through the capsule and then we tie both of them once we tie both of them it gives a this gives us both superficial layer as well as a deep layer repair so another case 18 year old girl had a ulna sided pain for 16 months and she had a uh, abnormal swelling in the carpal metacarpal joint so again tlcc repair was done at the same setting at the for the we wanted to know what is happening in the carpal metacarpal joint so we used a needle scope and through the needle scope we did a synovial biopsy it turned out to be non specific synovitis because we wanted to rule out early tuberculosis so this was taken so scopically you can do small joint arthroscopy also at the same time radial tears usually usually we debride them if it is not unstable or if it is stable we have to repair them uh, another case uh, ulnocarpal ligament which are like uh, 
alnolunate and alnolunate vector ligaments. So this was a case in which this was an injury which was going from the dorsal capsule to the carpal bones. So the sutures were used, multiple sutures and mulberry knot was used inside technique to repair this ligament. So this is from the dorsally, from the uh, attachment of the capsule and the couple ligaments. So I'll just skip the thing. So at the end of the surgery, this is what we achieve. Uh, multiple sutures to repair the ligament. Another talk, uh, another part of the talk is arthroscopic assisted reduction and fixation. Um, the advantages are we can see the reduction directly. So intraarticular fractures, uh, we can visualize the reduction and achieve a more a better reduction once we have achieved by direct methods by arthroscopically. And at the same time, we can uh, treat the associated ligamentous and TSCC injuries. So uh, uh, first of all, we when we inflate the joint, we try to aspirate the hematoma also. So or otherwise, we can just for a few seconds we can let the uh, blood wash out uh, from the joint because blood. Uh, I do wet scopy. Uh, I, I usually uh, prefer wet scopy because the, uh, it's a personal choice or my vis visualization is better by wet scopy. First, drain out the hematoma, then we inspect the joint in which we see what is the configuration of the fracture, uh, assess the articular strip, how much is the articular strip, and at the same time, we assess the ligamentous and TFCC injury. So, first thing is you just uh, do the diagnostic scopy. Then, once you have achieved how you assess the strip, you know the diameter of probe is one millimeter. So, in relation to the probe, you see the what is your step at the fracture site. So you know how much you have to or where you have to do the uh, reduction. So first of all, we do external manipulation. We can do use puppeteers wire or maybe distractor and check the reduction under the intense uh, image intensifier. If we are happy, then we go back again. Once we are again in the joint, once we are again in the joint, uh, we use probe and uh, uh, curved punches to get the reduction. Video is not working, but we'll see that in other video. And once we have achieved the intraarticular reduction, then we can go for more definite fixation by using more wires, more pocket in a screws or plate. We'll be seeing in another example. And at, at the same time, we can give a bone substitute also to uh, fill the void, subchondral void. So this is one of the examples. This is a step, step reduced. This is a final, this thing. The patient with the uh, post-op results. Another case in which uh, uh, comminuted fracture, very comminuted fracture, the, she was getting married. So we did a percutaneous and arthroscopic assisted fixation for her. This was the result and this is how she was. And that was the amount of cosmesis. Again, we'll discuss another case, 27-year-old male, intraarticular cognitive fracture. So first of all, as we said, we just uh, did a preliminary reduction, fixed one of the, uh, fixed one of the fragments with the wire and uh, temporarily Plate also, not passing all the screws. This was the reduction. Then we used a punch. This is a punch used from the outside to elevate the fracture. It was elevated like this. This is a small punch. And then finally, we went to uh, make the reduction perfect. So uh, with the help of the probe, this was reduced. Once we have reduced the fracture, Then we put a, a bone substitute and a definite fixation by fixing all the uh, screws to get a very good reduction. So this was the case, final case was this. Again, um, uh, we can do TSCC repair at the same time and just getting a reduction with the help of punches. And this was a TSCC repair because after fixation, the REJ was stable. 
So uh, we use a outside in technique in which we use a, uh, a different technique in uh, uh, epidural needle is used. So we take two sutures uh, for like this through the uh, TSCC into the capsule and tie them together to get the stability and immobilize. In acute cases, because healing is there, you just stabilize the joint and afterwards volar and dorsal ligaments, they also become, they heal and give more stability. Another case, 21-year-old male had a bilateral injury in which there was a scaffold injury as well as TSCC injury, distributed disconnected. On the right side, left side, there was only a Intraarticular fracture, so both sides stabilization was done. Right side, we did a ORF with scaphoid stabilization, in which we uh, did a K wire fixation, and at the same time, we did a TSCC repair. On the left side, arthroscopic assisted percutaneous screw fixation was done. So, when we review the literature for the arthroscopic assisted fixations, we can see uh, that it is helpful in assessing the articular surface accurately. And this was uh, in 18, 2018, the paper was published. Again, there was another paper in which uh, they said arthroscopic assisted fixation is advantageous. Only thing is uh, you need a little bit experience. So uh, it outweighs all the disadvantages. So once person is uh, able to do it, they should do it. And well, this is an another uh, paper from Japan, where they went ahead and they said anyone who is less than 70 years with more than one mm step should always go arthroscopic assisted fixation. I think that is a little bit overkill, but again, recommendation have been there in literature. Uh, arthroscopic assisted fixation, uh, scaphoid, I will not go through it because it will be just repetition what Dr. Butt and Dr. Wallen has said. So this was just a scope and you just see the reduction to mid carpal joint and this is a guide wire and you do as you do for cutaneous screw fixation. In conclusion, arthroscopic uh, TSCC repair is a well established and, uh, procedure with a very predictable outcomes with low complication rate. And DREJ injuries as uh, Dr. Warrior also said, they can be missed so we should carefully look for them and treat them at earlier because later on uh, many times salvage is the only option. Um, so, and uh, arthroscopy does not increase the complication rate. The only thing is there is a learning curve. And when we are uh, uh, fixing the fractures, we uh, we can do them accurately, even much better than uh, when you are using CM only. And associated injuries in radius fractures can be treated arthroscopically. Uh, just like TSCC repairs acute in acute cases. So in conclusion, arthroscopy is a safe procedure, good amount of diagnostic as well as therapeutic value in cases of risk injuries. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your informative talk. And moving on to the last speaker of the day, we have an international speaker, Dr. Kadam from Dubai, who has a special interest in biologics. Sir, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Can you share your slides, please? Yes. Left side bottom. Presenter view. Uh, thank you, dear Khan and uh, Dr. Uh, Vikas Gupta for uh, they are our teacher and our mentor and Professor Kotwal. So I'll be talking about a new, basically developing branch. It's called orthobiology. And uh, mostly we are using it in hip, knee, and other major joints, and also in some cases for wrist injuries and wrist disorders. So I have no disclosure. I have no association with any particular company or any product. So this is basically my background. So it's mainly into the joints, hip and knee, and uh, oncological orthopedic reconstruction. 
for last seven year uh, i uh, for the last seven year during my practice uh, i have come up across there are many patient who are having problems of the wrist and other major joints and uh, they are not a candidate for surgery and they are also somewhere in the middle where the surgery is not indication and the conservative treatment usually like painkiller splint physiotherapy is not working and it's a very frustrating issue not for the patient also for the physician and uh, then i came uh, i was introduced to this uh, regenerative medicine so i'll be talking about brief introduction what is regenerative medicine what are the product and how we can use it in other joint as well as in the wrist so these are the main product which we are using or currently available they are based either from the blood which are called blood dry product or from the cells like stem cell or from the serum and of course we have this last one it's called prolotherapy which is there for last 70 years so currently my 50% of practice is based on regenerative medicine and during this uh, process uh, uh, we have published many paper actually if you come across the literature you actually don't get a comprehensive and concise view how stem cells are working so this paper is about that and how it is also helping in the covid patient what are the real scenario for the prp and uh, are there any evidence based regarding uh, results safety and efficacy so these are the few publication we have published so orthobiologic uh, is basically part of regenerative medicine and regenerative medicine is actually a process in which you're using your own cells or tissue either to restore the normal function or helping in repair they may not be actual regeneration but they do improve the pain and quality of life so basically in an adult patient whenever there is any injury it is followed by a scar formation because there's not a big regenerative potential and here comes the role of the regenerative medicine when you use certain biological product from your own body and you give a support then it reduces the scarring formation and clinically the patient feels better in terms of pain improve range of function and of course the quality of the life but there are a lot of uh, misconception or you can say the hype of false claim or we can say even fraud regarding the stem cell because if you try to look into different sites or you know the commercial side or some magazines so they say that the regenerative medicine is miracle it can cure everything it can actually regenerate the cartilage tendon ligament tissue there are no side effects and there are so many products which are there in the market who are not standardized, but there are false claims that 100% return to the uh, physical activity, sports, and there are a lot of inexperienced practitioners. So these are the challenges which are basically hindering the progress of uh, orthobiologic or regenerative medicine, but it's still it's coming up in the, in the practice. So these are the different products. So I will just talk briefly about the stem cells. So stem cell basically the mother cells which are there in different parts of our human body. And we know that the skin is renewed every uh, few weeks, same is with the intestine. And basically the stem cell are unspecialized cells, but they can self-renew, they can increase their number, and they can convert into different cells. Like if you take a cell from bone marrow, it can convert into the fat, cartilage, and bone cell at least outside the body. It doesn't happen actually in view or inside the body. There are two uh, different kinds of stem cell. One is adult, which are all anything which is beyond after three to five days of the embryonic stage is actually adult stem cell. And which is first three to five days is actually embryonic. And now the third is coming, which is called induced pluripotent stem cell, which means they're adult cell, but they are genetically more programmed to behave like embryonic stem cell. So adult stem cell has a limited ability to convert into different cell. Embryonic stem cell, they have an unlimited ability and therefore there is also a risk of formation of cancer because you can't control the growth. Now there are two main sources of stem cell, either from your own body, we, we know either from the bone marrow or from your fat, from the tummy or from the, from the backside. 
and now different specialty there's you know, separating the stem cell like dental pulp skin even from the heart and the muscle or is a allogenic from umbilical cord or from the amniotic now if we talk about the fat fat is the main source of the stem cell so there are three kind of product are there one is called mat micro fragmented adipose tissue which means you are taking a fat from a mini liposuction and you are mechanically basically separating the fat which is rich in stem cell when you use enzymes to break down the extracellular matrix to release the stem cell then it become a svf and when you use either like certain kits or uh, equipments to separate the stem cell or you send it to the lab for uh, proliferation and then you take like you you take 10000 stem cell and then you multiply in the lab and for per joint we usually use around 20 million cell it's called adipose drive or culture expanded stem cell now the if you compare the bone marrow stem cell and the adipose stem cell 1 ml of a lipoaspirate contain uh, 1 lakh to 1 million of adipose drive stem cell but in the same amount of bone marrow you just have 50 to 675 bone marrow stem cell now the a lot of people are basically misusing this term stem cell any product which is cell based is called mesenchymal stem cell so that's why this ist he they basically different guidelines that if you fulfill these criteria which are positive for certain marker and if they are showing differentiation in vitro then only you can call them as stem cell kaplan was the first one who gave this and he visited this concept and he agree with this that the stem cell are not actually the stem cell they are derived basically from the stromal cell which are present in each tissue and cells of your body but he did not agree that they should be called as a stromal cell they should be called as medicinal signaling cell because they are they are basically secreting certain growth factors this paper we published that we basically combine whatever the knowledge available in the public domain how stem cell work and uh, they should be called like a maintenance stem cell because what they are doing they are promoting a healing environment and maintaining it and we know in osteoarthritis it mainly a catabolic stage and they mediated by interleukin 1 alpha dehydrogenic factors and metallopeptide 13 which lead to degeneration and the osteoarthritis so this paper basically describe how actually the stem cell work so basically when you inject a stem cell inside the body there is a anti environment which means there is more apoptosis there is more inflammation more fibrosis and there is a less angiogenic so when we inject a stem cell 90% of those stem cell they die but before dying they release growth factors and cytokines and these growth factor and cytokines there are some local resident stem cell they wake them these sleeping cells and the, the first stage is the first index and response where there is a, these growth factor are creating a healing environment which can recruit the more cells by releasing these signals energy and support from the injected stem cell and the first induction response start in the second stage is this this is called the sustained induction response which means there are more cells more energy more cytokines and the healing is more and ultimately then this uh, the, the this process stops down or slow down it lead to the limited induction response so basically you inject a stem cell it start something it continue and if you want to continue you must repeat the stem cell injection so overall stem cell or all the regenerative product basically they are doing these three things they are reducing inflammation they are promoting increased vascularity healing and repair and the stem cell also has immunosuppressive effect so in in osteoarthritis what they are doing they are basically they are converting they they are promoting the conversion of m1 macrophage to m2 because m1 is promoting inflammation and m2 is immunosuppressive they are also preventing mast cell degranulation they are immunosuppressive and the main immunosuppressive effect is they prevent the t cell proliferation they also inhibit the natural killer cells and they also inhibit the b cell division during g, 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 during g0 phase so stem cell we know we either from the bone marrow or from the uh, adipose tissue we are using bone marrow spray for ages 
and now there are refined technique and some kits are there in which you can concentrate the bone marrow you take the bone marrow use the kit and you concentrate it so when you concentrate the bone marrow this is the picture it looks like this is the buffy coat which is rich in the bmac and growth factor so basically you are increasing the number of the progenitor cell and the stem cell and reducing the red cell if you compare the bmac the bone marrow concentrate with the prp there are stem cell are there in bmac prp hardly have any uh, stem cell although one or two study they show that there are some peripheral stem cell are there growth factors are more in the bone marrow concentrate now the basic product which is most commonly used is the prp there are many definition are there if you have 1 million platelet per cubic per microliter or you have 3 to 5 and even one definition is anything which is above the baseline like 150000 to 350000 is actually the prp it has a lot of protein lot of growth factors so basically prp of two type if it is rich in leukocyte then it's called leukocyte rich leukocyte rich we want when we want inflammation like if you have a injury the ligament injury tendon injury around the wrist or anywhere the joints when when you inject the leukocyte they stimulate they cause more inflammation so healing is more but when we are talking about the joint hip knee or wrist you want basically the leukocyte prp because you don't want leukocyte if you inject inside the joint it will lead to the more inflammation effusion and swelling so we prefer for the joint leukocyte poor and when you want more healing and inflammation you should use leukocyte rich then the another concept come whether you should use activated or non activated there are many kits are there in the market and there is a lot of my kit is better their kit is better but if you use a manual simple technique you can reproduce the same product with the same efficacy so usually the best activator for the platelet is the local tissue when you inject a platelet into any affected area there is collagen and collagen is the best activator you can also use calcium thrombin mechanical or light to stimulate it now what actually the platelet does platelet has many growth factors and cytokines so this is how the platelet looks this is basically the rbc and uh, this is the buffy coat which is mainly rich in white blood cell and then you have the top portion which is mainly platelet and some wbc platelet has alpha granules all the growth factors like fibroblast hepatic epidermal igf all of them they are basically promoting healing the import some of the important factors in the in them are basically the sdf1 which is stromal drive factors this basically promote it it helps in migration proliferation of stem cell so basically directing the stem cell to the site of the injury and the vgf is promote more vascularization and pdgf now there is evidence uh, for uh, prp in other tendinopathy like level 1 evidence is there for the tennis elbow patellar tendinopathy osteoarthritis for the other area particularly the wrist and the ankle it's coming up but we need more randomized study to actually decide the role so these are the common indication around the wrist and in the wrist if you have decurrent uh, when you have tendinitis or ecu partial tear of tfcc cmc joint osteoarthritis if you have interligament injury with instability or minimal instability with erosion sprain when there is an explained or unresolved wrist pain when there is post surgical stiffness osteoarthritis or radiocarpal osteoarthritis it also work in the tendon so basically in the tendon this is the smooth organized collagen but when there is tendinopathy they get disorganized cellularity is increased so prp basically induce more towards the tenosynovitis differentiation stem cell also help uh, the prp in the same way is there any evidence in the risk actually there are not many good quality of studies mainly they are like case control study only there is one prospective randomized control trial like in this study they use six patient two to four prp injection follow up was 6.5 and they have shown there is a significant reduction in the pain 42% rest and active and as well as the functionality improve overall improvement was 54 point patient and this was mainly for the unresolved wrist pain this was the another paper in uh, the hand congress and total patient 16 and uh, they used basically the uh, prp with the growth factors in arthroscopic at the time of arthroscopic development for the tfcc 
and there they found there is a significant pain relief and improved quality of life. There is another patient from Sabdajang, and they also use uh, basically single injection of PRP for TFCC, ultrasound guided, and they have also shown that the patient-related risk stabilization score is better, and the pain and the improve there is an improved function of the wrist. Now, this is the only randomized, uh, basically prospective randomized control which has been used for the thumb base osteoarthritis. And uh, they have shown that it improved the pain function. Then this is for the radiocorporal osteoarthritis. They used in three patients, PR3 and FAT. And 12-month uh, follow-up showed that there is a reduced pain. And the clinically, you know, there was a clear MCD was better in terms of DAS and PRWE. So basically, uh, the role of PRP, if you have done surgery, like fixation for the distal end of radius or the scaphoid or arthroscopic procedure, and patient is still having pain, swelling, you have tried physiotherapy, still there is a stiffness. And sometimes you can't explain the pain, even by uh, uh, whatever the MRI, CT or investigation you have done. So in those patients, you can try PRP. It is a simple procedure. And uh, usually I recommend for the ligament leukocyte rich and for the joint we use leukocyte poor. You need for the joint around two to four ml. If it is a small joint like CMC or IP, then you can use around one ml of leukocyte poor. The number of injection are one, two, three. Usually we give three injection at weekly interval under ultrasound guidance. Usually after the injection, patient have mild pain and swelling, which lasts for a few days. During this, uh, during this treatment or for next six weeks or before one week before the procedure, patient should not be on NACID because NACID, they stop the action of these biological products, including the PRP. And uh, Panadol, uh, uh, like uh, usually we use 665 milligram, two dose for one, two, do two dose is enough. Some ice fermentation. And then later on, you do put the uh, patient into the physiotherapy. So PRP just adjuvant is not a uh, replacement to the surgical treatment, whether it's arthroscopic or non-arthroscopic. Another product is the serum. This is called Goldic. This is a German product. They take basically blood, put in a specialized tube, 24 hour, and the next day they separate the serum. Initially, they use in the ankle. And then uh, they later on, they use in the uh, knee joint. And now we are, uh, we are also using in the neck and uh, with the back. I'm using for those neck and back, pre-injection, post-injection, but these are just representative. And um, there may not be any MRI changes in these. Same way we are using the PRP in tennis elbow also. There's a level one evidence. So this is the my patient. Basically, you do under ultrasound guidance. You reach the area of the attachment. You need to go to the bony attachment also into the common extensor tendon or reason. Sometimes the patient has pain in the joint, then you can direct the needle to the joint also. So uh, this is my talk. So in nutshell, regenerative medicine or orthobiology is your upcoming branch. It has definitely uh, a role and as a adjuvant, not as a primary treatment. But if those patients who don't need surgery or who are who don't want surgery, then definitely it may be a primary modality. Patient should be explained. It's a slow process. Usually the effect start coming in two to three weeks, three to four months for the full, full result. And uh, you should not take NSID during this treatment. So if the patient knows, they understand it, complication. Usually these treatments, they don't have any side effect. There is a lot of uh, uh, basically the uh, uh, dilemma about the stem cell, adult stem cell, they don't actually cause any cancer. Until now, there's not any single report uh, with the adult stem cell, with embryonic and IPC. Yes, there are certain reports. So thank you. I would be happy uh, when the panel, when there is a question is on the session with the panel. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. Uh, we think, I think we can now go on to questions if uh, any of the faculty members or participants have any questions for the speakers. Any question, please, Dr. Do you have any personal opinions? Your volume is uh, low. Can you be louder?
Yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. You can hear yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Now, my question is to Dr. Ashu. Uh, do you have any personal experience in DURG injuries? Drug injuries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you are uh, muted, Dr. Ashok. Dr. Ashok, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I have a personal experience treating a few partial TFCC injury in elite sport person who don't want surgery because they want to join the competition and they want fast return. So in those patients under ultrasound guidance, I inject two, uh, live, uh, two injection of PRP which is 2 to 3 ml of leukocyte rich. I try to inject into the central portion and between the ulnar styloid and the trichotrum. And also I inject a little bit amount into the joint also. So after that, we, we give a brace for a few days with Panadol. And after uh, 10 days, we mobilize the joint. Usually the three weeks, the patient had significant improvement in the pain. I will not say it's healing. It's just the relief in the pain. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? So I would like to ask Dr. Warrior a question regarding the... He's left. He's left. Okay. So Dr. Warlin is there? Yes. Hi. Yes. So, yes. Uh, what would be your uh, indication regarding the duration since injury? How would you select a patient for arthroscopic assisted scaphoid fracture fixation? Does it affect whether the patient is fresh injury or old injury? Um, can, can you ask a little bit more slower, please? Okay. So if the patient has a fresh injury or yes. it is an old injury, would that affect your decision to do an arthroscopic assisted scaphoid fixation? Uh, um, when it's before three months, I do percutaneous because uh, I saw that there are studies that say it's not so good to do arthroscopically uh, fixation. But after three months, I prefer to do the graft. So uh, I'm sure it will with arthroscopy. Okay, so if you're dealing with a patient with a humpback deformity, ah. do you find it, uh, how do you tackle that arthroscopically? Uh, yes, with humpback deformity is uh, very difficult because I have to, to, I have many bone loss at the end of the liberation of the non-union, but I put many, many grafts and I put a big uh, pin. That's why I said no more screw uh, when there is unback deformity, and with the big pin of uh, 16, you can uh, make the scaphoid a little bit straight, and, uh, and then you can do this fixation. And in France, we think that uh, with Jean-Michel Cognier, maybe the conclusion of the symposium will be uh, that it's not so bad if unback deformity is not fully uh, corrected because you know sometimes you have like a banana scaphoid is not so good also it can be painful so uh, I, I think my humpback deformity I can correct that, them about half half of the deformity not completely but I think uh, it's not so bad for the future and I will follow the patient to be sure it's not so bad yeah so that uh, I think the message which I take is that humpback deformity may not be corrected completely if we have a minimally invasive procedure to fix the scaphoid fractures. Do I get that? Y yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Vinit, uh, can yes. I add a line? See, the yes. Anil showed that uh, joystick method. So joystick by passing a, the, what uh, Violin was trying to say, you put in a wire and try to correct the deformity, then you put a lot of graft polar words that can help in correcting the deformity, am I right? Yes, because I have a problem with when I do radiolinate uh, technique, 
is not good for arthroscopy because you cannot move with your camera, so joystick is better. Like in a retrolinate when you are open. Yeah, actually my query was that the defect is volar. Doing an arthroscopy, do you use a volar portal to put the graft there? Because I don't think we can put a graft volar uh, on the volar side of the scaphoid if we are using the dorsal portal. So you are going mid carpal joint. So when you are going mid carpal joint, you put a graft uh, from medial to volar. Anil, would you like to comment on it? Yeah. Um, uh, so what? Uh, please go ahead. Please. Yeah. Well, thank you. I put the camera in ulnar mid carpal and uh, 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 the trocar in uh, radial mid carpal. So, uh, but I have to be very careful that the graft doesn't fall in radiocarpal joints. So uh, we don't free too much the side, the lateral side of the scaphoid, because we want to keep the graft uh, on the uh, distal part. Correct. If you look at it, uh, 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 you know, uh, from Hong Kong, uh, does is uh, after putting the graft. So that is one way of doing it. Some people actually, you know, inflate a fully catheter bulb inside so that the graft doesn't extravasate into the radiocarpal joint. So, but with it, what happens is basically you're going from the ulnar side only. As uh, I was telling you, if you're in the mid carpal joint, you're actually looking at the ulnar part of the scaphoid. So, and then you're passing when you drill the hole you you basically from the uh, distal pole you push the graft inside that that is one way of doing it and also packing it directly and arthroscopic assistance you'll be going to the fracture site itself on the ulnar cortex so keeping the dorsal cortex intact you can use a k wire as a strut and then put in the graft so that you can maintain the length and also you can get rid of the dc deformity in a humpback thank you uh, thank one you. last question from dr vikas Sir, I think the risk scopy assisted radius fracture fixation would be best indicated in a type C3 fracture, which is having a highly comminuted uh, intra-articular component. So while doing a wet scopy, do you find it, uh, do you find the post-op swelling or carpal tunnel symptoms no. significant? See, we leave it open. That is a like lot of discussion in this society. Many people put a hash mark. I think Anil puts a hash mark. Many people do a dry scopy. See, when my fracture is open, the fluid extravasates outside. Like uh, when I'm putting a plate, see in these cases, we are putting a plate. So we are already open from the volar side. So when you're putting a fluid, fluid just, uh, if we have time, we can show the video. The fluid just comes out of the fracture site outside. So the compartment is open. So you don't have to do anything. It just extravasates out. Thank you. If anybody has any okay. other questions, I have a question for Dr. Ashok, please. Yes. Uh, uh, would you advise uh, to do systematically two PRP injection for a uh, uh, tennis elbow or do you want and you see? No, for the tennis elbow, I give one injection Me and too. then we wait for six weeks and we see how much is the patient response. If the patient response is less than 50%, then I go for the second injection and the PRP should be leukocyte rich PRP under ultrasound guidance. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Are you able to hear us? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes.
Yeah, yeah. So there are various method has been prescribed to prepare the PRP, but it's very difficult to standardize this procedure. So I want to know how you prepare the PRP actually, and how you standardize this procedure. So basically, there are many product, you know, and you you should follow the depending upon the kit. But I usually use a manual PRP. So we have our own lab, and uh, we are using uh, for the. Uh, basically, you have sterile tube, which is very easy to get. In uh, these are called cortical sterile tube. So, if you want to prepare a leukocyte poor PRP, you need to see how much you need. Usually, when you take 30 cc of blood, then you get around three to five ml of PRP. So, depending upon for which area you need, you should take that much amount of the blood. So, you take uh, suppose we. Take like thirty cc. So we use a uh, anticoagulant. You should use ACD. You should not use EDTA because EDTA damages the platelet. So use citrate dextrol. So for every twenty ml of blood, you need to add two ml of anticoagulant. And then when you are withdrawing the blood, the speed should be less than one cc per second. Now once you have withdrawn the blood, if you want leukocyte poor. Then use centrifuge depending upon what kind of centrifuge machine you have, because each machine has a different rotor, and your uh, RPM or the RCF depend upon your rotor. So usually, what I am using the machines basically, you do first spin, which is three hundred G force for five minutes. So this is this spin is to separate the blood into. Uh, three component. The lowermost is the RBC, middle is the buffy coat, which has WBC and some platelet, and then the top layer is the plasma and the platelet. So suppose if you want leukocyte poor, then you just take the top portion of the plasma with platelet and stay 0.1 centimeter above the buffy coat so that you are not taking the leukocyte. If you want a leukocyte rich PR, PRP, then you need to take buffy coat. With top portion, and then you go for the second spin. Second spin is usually 700 uh, g force for 17 minutes. Now, once you have done the second spin, if you want leukocyte poor, then you just need to take the top portion supernatant, which has platelet, and you leave behind the buffy coat. But if you want the leukocyte, then you take both. So this is the usual standard. <clears throat> Now, how to see uh, how much cell should be there? The best way is first you need to take a blood sample from the patient and send it for the uh, hematology and see how much is the platelet count. And from the final product, again send it to the lab or or whatever the facility you have, and then see how much is the actual platelet concentration. Ideally, it should be three to five times above. Most of the product which are there in the market, they just go only like two to three times, and some of them they are even below the baseline. So anything above three to five is good product. You take thirty uh, cc of the blood in one go in a one uh, one tube. Usually, you use either twenty cc syringe, or you have a fifty or sixty, depending upon how much you need. Thirty will give three to five ml. So depending upon how much you need, you can use the sorry syringe. So you put the syringe itself in the centrifuge? No, you need to put the first. You need to take a sterile tube with anticoagulant. For every twenty ml blood, add two ml of anticoagulant in a sterile tube, plastic tube, and then you put the that tube in the centrifuge. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, what more? <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to add one more comment in this regard. As far as the preparation of PRP is concerned, it should be done in a cold temperature around 18 to 20 degrees to yield the best results for the platelets without damaging the platelets. Yeah, because if you are not maintaining the proper temperature, it lead to premature activation of the platelet and also damage the platelet cell wall. So there are some centrifuge or temperature control also. Okay. 
Now, now we now we ിസ്റ്റേഷൻ Thanks everybody. I'm audible there. Vikas, am I audible? Yes, to hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. Good, great. Thanks a lot. I think uh, a very enlightening uh, few hours of uh, wrist injury. Very grateful to all the speakers and uh, also the dignitaries who have uh, stayed along and who have been actively listening and there's a big uh, crowd here on the physical front also uh, who are attending the program and you've actually enlightened uh, the thoughts about uh, wrist injury and uh, i'm sure it's going to be beneficial so i have been uh, asked to declare the results the midcom uh, has as a part every year a poster competition a pg quiz the pg quiz the the team who gets selected goes and represents the state mm-hmm. in the national quiz so it's uh, customary to do it every year and a poster session is also done every year for the post graduates to en- encourage them on uh, uh, doing this activity so we had uh, the quiz because i'm audible yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the audible here. So, uh, for the quiz, the first team is uh, Dr. Shashank Verma and Subhashish Mandal. So, they uh, secured the mas- maximum points, and they are a team from uh, MAMC. The second team is uh, Dr. Akash Bali and Dr. Akhil Vadwa. Again, this is from MAMC. The third team is Dr. Durgesh and Dr. Arjun from Lady Harding Medical College. this uh, quiz was uh, conducted by two of our executive committee member dr vijay jain who is from rml and dr amit sharma who is from uh, lady harding and it was very ably supported by our vice president dr pradeep bageja it was stand stand alone offline event which was conducted last sunday at rml hospital at an excellent venue arranged by dr vijay jain so we will uh, put up these results on the website also those who have missed it uh, would uh, look at it from there and i congratulate the winning team and bug them up for participating and representing delhi uh, on the national forum the second is the poster competition and uh, the winner is dr apurva kabra from all india institute of medical sciences the second position is dr abdul sami from ram manohar lohia hospital there is a tie at the third uh, position there are two uh, pgs one is dr pranshu jain from lady harding medical college and dr sagar bagwe from mulana azad medical college i am very excited to share that uh, this poster competition was totally blinded and uh, i am grateful that dr sumit sural uh, professor director professor at mulana azad medical college conducted the evaluation process and it was kept totally blinded to the members to the executive committee and everybody uh, who is a part of it and we are grateful to the judges uh, who are dr matthew wogis from uh, st stephen hospital dr ak paul from uh, calcutta medical college head of department and dr gupta from uh, tanda medical college who is the principal 
so all three are uh, great clinicians and academicians and uh, they did a very detailed evaluation and they actually also proposed uh, a revision in the process that we are following they said that there is no competition between case series and case reports so there would always be case reports uh, in a post of competition and they have proposed a special prize to the best case report and they said that this case report actually scored higher than the case series presented and they have uh, announced the name of dr mohit agarwal as the best case uh, report poster so we would be giving an extra consolation prize this time dr mohit agarwal so this much for the uh, results and i would just take another minute on uh, sharing with you that we are going to be celebrating the bone and joint week from 1st to 7th of august and we'll have various activities and we will be uh, posting those on the website as well as all the uh, whatsapp groups and uh, and the uh, most important thing uh, which we are coming out is a lecture a keynote lecture by none other than respected divine sister shivani uh, who is going to be talking on work life balance and this is going to be on 3rd of august which is a wednesday at 7 pm so we'll be circulating all the details we are coming out with lots of activities in that one week and today at this meeting also uh, there are certain posters and stickers which we have brought which we are distributing towards the members uh, to have it and uh, my message here would be incomplete uh, unless i thank the organizers of today's event which is the west delhi orthopedic association and uh, on the lead of that is dr atul vash and dr gopal goel and also dr harmesh kapoor and a great thanks to dr vikas gupta who is the scientific chairman for the event and he has collected you know uh, jewels for us today on uh, best of speakers which we could have on the topics and the topics were so well thought of that uh, nobody could uh, leave the webinar once they joined it so grateful to you vikas and also grateful to each of the faculty who has taken out time and stayed stayed with us and answered to uh, any queries which were raised so i hand it over back to the organizers to dr atul vash to say the final words good afternoon everyone and good morning maybe for our international faculty it's an honor for me to present the vote of thanks first of all our sincere thanks to dr lalit mani president delhi orthopedic association for giving us this opportunity to organize this midcon 21 and he has been a great help during this preparation of this conference and today we were fortunate to have a galaxy of stalwarts in the field of orthopedics our sincere thanks to dr shiv shankar sir president ioa and dr navin thakkar sir secretary ioa for their gracious presence and sharing their vast experience with us thank you so much sir we thank our international faculty dr amitab lahiri dr kadam and dr violin for sparing their valuable time i congratulate congratulate you for your excellent presentation thanks to our national faculty dr anil bhat dr pankaj jindal dr sudhir warrior dr kotwal sir dr vikas gupta and dr sandeep saini for their excellent deliberations and making this meet a great success we all have been wiser today which will help everyone to have a clear perspective in the management of the wrist injuries thanks to our moderators dr harmesh kapoor and dr vinit uh, dabas for conducting a very successful inter interactive session our special thanks to dr vikas for asking the international and the national members to be a part of this meet and to make it a great success and special thanks to all the delegates who have joined today meet virtually or physically thanks a lot and i wish you a nice day and i also want to thank omnicorus for this excellent opportunity and presentation where it was a flawless meet and i wish that everybody must have uh, experienced this that they were 
flawless during this presentation thank you so much omnicaris for that